It was a quiet night like any other, a thick blanket of Texas heat suffocating the air. The town of Ransom Creek didn't stir after sundown. We were used to it, the silence, the stillness, broken only by the occasional cricket chirp or distant rumble of cattle shifting in their pens. It was the kind of place where nothing much happened. Or so we told ourselves. I was a deputy back then, just a kid in my early twenties, barely finished with academy training. Ransom Creek wasn't exactly a breeding ground for law enforcement excitement. Most days, the highlight of my shift was helping old man Sutter drag his broken down truck off the side of the road. But 1982 changed everything. That year put Ransom Creek on the map, though no one speaks about it now. But I can't forget, even if I wanted to. The first call came in on a blistering July night. Local rancher, Clint Faber, found his daughter missing. At first, we figured she'd gone out drinking with some boy. Teenage rebellion wasn't a new thing around here. But by dawn, when she hadn't shown up, the town got nervous. Search parties were formed, but by day three, there wasn't a trace of her. It wasn't until a week later that we found what was left of her. I remember standing there at the edge of the Faber property. It was my first real investigation, and the sheriff was doing his best to keep me calm, even though I could see his hands shaking. The body was, well, it wasn't whole. Parts of her were scattered, like some animal had gotten to her, but there were things no animal could do. Her skin was ripped open, not like it was clawed, but peeled back, almost delicate, as if something had taken its time. That wasn't the worst of it. It was the look in her eyes. What was left of them? A kind of frozen terror, mouth open like she tried to scream, but no sound came. Word spread fast, and the town locked down. Curfews were set, parents wouldn't let their kids out of sight, and no one dared venture into the woods anymore. We thought it was over. We prayed it was over. Three weeks later, another family was found, this time a young couple passing through town. They were camping by the river, and by morning, they were shredded in the same way. Ripped to pieces, no signs of an animal, no tracks, no clues. Just blood. I was the one who had to tell the sheriff what I found that night. He was an old timer, but I saw the fear in his eyes when I told him. In the dirt by the campsite, I found marks. Deep scratches, not from claws, but long, thin fingers. Five of them. Not human, I remember him whispering, and then he crossed himself. We didn't talk much about religion on the job, but something about those deaths had everyone questioning what we were dealing with. I was naive back then thought maybe there was some rational explanation. Maybe a wild animal, a person even. Some sick bastard from out of town. But the truth was something far darker. It happened again and again. Every few weeks, another body. No rhyme or reason, no pattern, no mercy. The town was gripped by a kind of silent terror. But there were whispers, old stories the elders started to murmur. There was a man long ago who'd come through Ransom Creek. A drifter. They said he was strange, kept to himself, spent time out in the woods. He was always muttering in some language no one understood. When children started disappearing back then, the town turned on him. They dragged him out into the woods and did what they thought had to be done. But before they left him for dead, they say he spat out a curse, swore that something older than time would come for their children. They thought they could bury the past, but it seems curses have a way of digging themselves out. Sheriff didn't believe in that stuff. Neither did I. Not at first. Then came the night that changed everything. It was late August, the air thick with humidity. I was patrolling out by the edge of town, close to the woods. The radio crackled to life. A call. Someone had seen movement in the trees. My heart sank. I didn't want to go. But duty's duty, and I was the closest. I stepped out of the car, flashlight in hand, gun drawn. The woods were alive with sounds. Frogs croaking, cicadas buzzing, but underneath, something else. A low, guttural hum. It reverberated through the trees, and I couldn't tell where it was coming from. Then I saw it. At first, it was just a shadow, darting between the trees. Fast. Too fast. My flashlight caught a glimpse of it. Something tall, pale, with limbs that seemed to bend the wrong way. I froze. Its eyes. They weren't like anything I'd seen. They were deep, 
black voids, and when they locked onto me, I felt something twist inside my gut, like it was pulling at the very essence of me, dragging my soul toward it. I don't remember much after that. Just running. Firing shots into the dark. The thing screech like nails on metal, still rings in my ears to this day. When I stumbled back into town, the sheriff found me at the edge of the woods, shaking, covered in scratches, though I don't remember how I got them. No one believed me at first, not officially. But the killings stopped soon after, and the town gradually returned to its sleepy existence. The deaths were never solved. Officially, it was written off as a wild animal, but we all knew the truth. I'm older now. Wiser, I suppose. And while no one talks about it anymore, I keep my eye on those woods. Sometimes, late at night, I swear I can still hear that screech echoing in the distance. It's waiting. It's always waiting. And someday I fear it'll come back. There used to be a really nappy white-haired homeless guy who lived in the woods all over our small town. We were young and called him Scabby Nabby. Even though our town is small, it is spread out across many miles of woods and farmland. We would see old Scabby everywhere. My girlfriends and I would spend our days riding horses in the woods. One day, we came up on Scabby Nabby squatting in the bushes. When he jumped up, I don't know who spooked worse. Our horses or us. We started screaming about Bigfoot and Skunk Cape. Needless to say the horses had already turned tail and ran, scared the ever-living shit out of us. We came to the conclusion that he was probably taking a dump and we rode up on him. LOL. Pyramid Lake in Nevada has always rewarded me with creepy otherworldly experiences. It's a massive high desert ancient lake that has a mystical atmosphere. On one trip me and my friend Katie took her truck with a cab off-road to camp. We slept in the back of the truck cab, the kind with slide windows with a half moon overhead on the northwest side of the lake. I fell asleep fast and had the most realistic nightmare of my life. On the first occasion, there I was in the back of the truck. The moon had shifted to the window I was sleeping by and I was awakened in the dream by a rustling in the brush. Somehow the tailgate was down and the cab was open. A man appeared at the foot of the tailgate. His hair was matted and deadlocked. He was clothed in thick scraps of fur almost like a robe. He had a thick beard and was totally unshaven. He was hunched over and dark with filth. His eyes bulged with madness. I was paralyzed in fear. He reached under his furs and pulled out a huge dirty hunting knife. He started to furiously stab my feet and lower legs. That's when my friend shook me awake, I was screaming in my sleep. I was so relieved it was a nightmare. I looked out the window by my side of the bed, and the moon was in the same exact location as in my dream. I was filled with a sense we were not alone and convinced my friend to stay up until the sunrise with me. It was such a surreal experience. I felt like I was being visited by a crazed madman that lived in the caves of the desert 100 or more years ago. That feeling of being watched stayed with me on that trip until we left. One chilling evening, as the moon cast an eerie glow over the desolate woods, I found myself immersed in the haunting silence of nature. The air hung heavy with an unsettling stillness, and an inexplicable unease settled upon my shoulders. Little did I know, this night would etch a harrowing encounter into the recesses of my memory. Venturing into the heart of the forest, my senses heightened with each cautious step. The shadows played tricks on my mind, distorting the trees into menacing figures that whispered ancient secrets. As I trod further, a peculiar sensation crawled up my spine, urging me to remain vigilant. Suddenly, a piercing howl shattered the silence, resonating through the dense canopy above. My heart raced in response, and beads of sweat formed on my forehead. I strained my eyes to pierce through the darkness, attempting to decipher the source of this unearthly sound. That's when I saw it. A monstrous silhouette about 150 yards away. A great big, man-like ape emerged from the shadows, its dark coat blending seamlessly with the surrounding night. 
My breath caught in my throat as the creature's face and chest revealed a ghastly contrast. Lighter, almost ghostly, in the obsidian abyss. A wave of fear washed over me, paralyzing my every instinct. The creature's eyes, pools of darkness reflecting an otherworldly intelligence, locked onto mine. Time itself seemed to pause as we shared an inexplicable connection, the veil between the known and the unknown thinning to a mere whisper. The forest, once a haven of solitude, now cocooned me in an unsettling symphony of rustling leaves and ominous whispers. I could hear my own heartbeat, a frantic rhythm mirroring the intensity of the moment. In a sudden, deliberate motion, the creature turned and vanished into the shadows from whence it came. The echoes of its departure lingered, leaving me alone with the haunting question of what secrets the woods held. Secrets that transcended the boundaries of the natural world. With trembling limbs, I retraced my steps, haunted by the image of that great beast. The enigmatic encounter etched itself into the fabric of my reality, a phantom lingering at the edge of my consciousness, waiting to stir the embers of that bone-chilling night. I lived in a very small town once when I worked from my laptop, like population 200 small, I was in a small cabin in the woods, though next to the highway. One day I was walking my dog and heard two gunshots somewhere nearby. Didn't think much of it, it's a hunting area and it's kinder redneck-like. The next day, or the day after, a truck pulls up. I don't even know anyone in this town, so it's weird, and I'm put off. Guy calls me over, says he's my neighbor. Asks if I heard the shots. I said yeah. He claims it was his neighbor taking potshots at his house, over a land dispute. Doesn't ask me to be a witness for him or anything, just if I heard. Okay, seems really odd to me. Never met this guy before, and when I say neighbor, I mean 500 meters one kilometer away out of sight. Guy sees my dog digging somewhere unimportant, and all of a sudden starts trying to tell her not to do that. Gets out, and she's iffy of him, says here watch, calls her over. Grabs her and tries to do the stupid Cesar Chavez dominance, hold the dog on their back thing, for really no reason. She starts yelping, I'm like dude stop. He asks me whether I have any guns myself, I say no. Says he is a great dog trainer. He asks me to go over and mow his lawn, and please ensure to bring your dog. In the strangest way, just like that. Please ensure you bring my dog's name. I can't describe it but his mannerisms and the way he talked was just plain creepy, especially that line. He leaves soon after, and I'm thinking. If I just told this guy not only that I heard the gunshots, but that I'm unarmed here. How do I even know it was his neighbor like he claimed, and not in fact that this weird dude has shot someone at his home, and is trying to see who might have heard or witnessed. I wouldn't go to his house, not a chance. Horrible feeling. Then he kept showing up asking why, calling and texting asking why I gave him my number before realizing how weird he was. Really adamant I go over there. Turns out the guy is a total alky, lost his wife, lost his job, lost everything, very dangerous mental state. Nothing to lose. The small store owners in town explained the guy to me. He's apparently the most hated guy in the valley, bad reputation. I'm now really freaked out. I found it very hard to sleep after that. Cabin in the woods, nobody nearby that would hear any commotion, ample angles for the place to be approached from the woods, and just a can of bear spray and a knife. And the guy knows I have no guns. I would be kept up for hours listening at night for any movement outside, as it was dead silent there. One night, middle of the night, my dog starts to growl. Then growls more. I don't hear anything, but it didn't matter. Every room in that cabin had a window but the bathroom. I just got up, grabbed the knife plus bear spray and locked myself in that bathroom for hours listening. I think I eventually fell asleep in there. I don't think I've ever felt that kind of dread. I just pictured this lunatic sneaking up with a shotgun to take me out, for maybe having heard him murder someone with a gun days earlier. F, it was just awful. I moved, but unfortunately the new landlords were equally creepy and even started trying to steal my dog, even though they had three literally. I heard them discussing it, how they had to make themselves the in crowd so that she'd want to be with them and hand feeding her dog food when they thought I wasn't looking. 
Must have just been the small town thing, totally strange people in that town for the most part. They went to market one morning, I packed all my shit into my uninsured van with no license and my pup, and bailed that town and never looked back. Good God, it was hills have eyes shit mates, I'm telling ya. Twenty-five years ago or so. Saw eyes in the darkness of the trees when shining a flashlight out. Seemed kinda high up. They were red reflecting. Also was having sticks and rocks occasionally thrown into our camp. Nothing big, and it was directed at the fire. Eventually it stopped, and we went to bed. There was four of us. I'm a light sleeper, and so is my dad. We both woke up to footsteps and a really bad stink about 5 a.m. My dad shook the side of the tent and yelled, Get the F out of here. Whatever it was, it ran off. Cowlitz Country, Washington. Solo hunter here. I embarked on a solo trip into the Rocky Mountains of Colorado to hunt for mule deer. I scout and spend a lot of time in my unit, so I'm quite comfortable with it. August rolls around and bow season opens. So I head out there on opening day, set up camp, go hunting, etc. I return to my tent just before dark and notice the smell of cigarettes odd. I brush it off, thinking it might be another hunting camp nearby, and proceed to start my fire and relax. The next morning, I wake up to find a cigarette butt on the log I had been using as a chair near the fire just outside my tent. I brought an electric fence with me, usually used for grizzly areas, but my unit is heavy with lions, and I typically use it as a perimeter if I need to leave a dead animal out overnight or meet in a tree and set it up for the next day. I follow my routine of hunting, returning to camp, starting a fire, relaxing, and eventually falling asleep. However, sometime in the middle of the night, I am abruptly awoken by a scream or cursing someone had walked into my electrified fence. I grab my G17 and run out of my tent as fast as I can to the sound of someone crashing through the trees. I pursue the sound for a while because I'm not about to let someone scare me out of my week of hunting which I cherish deeply. I fire a few rounds into the air and it's followed by nothing but silence. The next morning, I investigate around my campsite and find a stash of 15-20 cigarette butts within 30 yards of camp, footprints, and what looks like a urine bottle. I decide to sleep in my bivy outside of my camp. I leave my tent up, thinking I may be able to catch the person if they come back and believe I'm still in camp. They never do. No more nonsense. No deer and unfortunately another year of store-bought factory farmed meat. What's odd is, I was way out there. My camp was six miles from the nearest road. It's possible someone had seen me scouting my area and slowly building my camp in the off-season and wanted it for themselves. I didn't have an experience with the dogmen, as you describe them often. However, I did encounter a wolf-like creature that makes your average timber wolf look like a rat. Some of my business brought me up to the unusually remote and desolate region between Canada and Alaska. I know it sounds like a bizarre, strange place to have any kind of business to attend, but hear me out. We were experiencing near total whiteout conditions, and it was a catch-22. If we tried to bed down and ride out the night, we would surely freeze. If we continued on our way with the weather being what it was, there was no telling what kind of directionlessness we could end up in and waste our efforts and resources. We made a tentative effort to rest for a very, very short time. I had a shotgun at the ready, even as remote as our location was, and there were always bears to look out for, or so I'm told. Plus, we were also in one of those regions where legends tend to stick. Most of them you couldn't take too seriously, but others made you wonder. Stories about Bigfoot and things that were just a little too big to be a normal bear or a normal bird. Just one of those places that could easily be hiding something we arrogantly assumed died out millions of years ago. Due to my heritage, I tend to buy more into the legends of the region stemming from the days of the Native American tribes that used to occupy the present land. I was dozing off when a sound even louder than the snowstorm reached me and jarred me awake violently. 
It sounded like a war zone when in fact it was our truck being moved by something. And when I say moved, I mean being tossed around like a Hot Wheels toy. I could just barely make out what looked like a living mountain of fur that was being rapidly glazed up by the storm. The bad thing about detailed descriptions in a snowstorm is that the brain attempts to fill in the gaps of what it can't see for sure. That's how snow blindness occurs. It's essentially sensory deprivation to the point where the brain creates light hallucinations to compensate. In the moment, I was pretty sure that this behemoth of fur had very small ears that were tucking themselves into the monstrous, broad head they were attached to. The forehead reminded me of a pit bull. That's where all the other similarities to anything else disappeared. It attempted to look like a wolf trying to be a bear. I know, bizarre and not as thrilling as a dogman. It wasn't appearing to walk on hind legs, and no, it did not have glowing red eyes, but it possessed a fierce, primal rage, and its eyes were visible without a light. I caught its gaze just long enough for it to redirect the anger from the truck over to us. Acting sooner than thinking, I raised the shotgun and let it have both barrels. The sheer size of the monster as it reared back on its hind legs, still not like a dogman, made the shotgun feel so ineffective. The thing's head was nearly giant. It swatted at the air as if that would deflect the buckshot. I reloaded with shaky hands, firing off two more rounds. I must have done this several times because the snow was starting to turn bloody. This monstrous bear wolf thing took off not dying but very much unnerved. That's when we made the decision to keep moving right then and there. Adrenaline and pure terror scouring my veins kept me warm for the time being. It also kept me alert, awake, and most importantly, alive. It's one thing to encounter a monster that you've never seen before. It's another to meet that monster entire leagues away from other people, other than your traveling buddies or just as puny and clueless as you. Like I said, I did not encounter a dogman, but this was still a terrifying experience for me. I wish you could see the way I'm shaking as I relive these moments. I love your show, and I'll be listening, and I thought it was important that I added my two cents and my own story to conclude. No, this was not a grizzly bear, even though it possessed the same size, if not larger. It looked vastly different. It looked more like a wolf combined with a bear, if that makes any sense, and had this unnatural viciousness to it. That's the best I can describe. I found this very strange journal when I was hiking in Yellowstone last summer. Normally I wouldn't even bother to mention it, but when I found it just sitting off the edge of the walkway around the big hot springs, I was curious. It was one of those really classic leather bound journals, and I love all of those rustic styles. After picking it up, I looked around at the crowd of people roaming across the walkways, thinking maybe someone just dropped it, but no one looked like they were looking for something. I even shouted that I found it, hoping the owner would come for it, but after getting a few strange looks, I figured the owner was long gone. At this point I was very curious as to what was in it, and I figured I might find some information to allow me to locate the owner, so I thumbed through it. What I found was shocking. Now, initially I thought it was just a story. You know, kind of like those creepypastas they have on Reddit. But as I continued to read, it was clear that this was not just a creepy story. Something is going on at Yellowstone, and I think everyone needs to know before it's too late. What I am about to tell you may sound like flat-out insanity, or someone trying to play a joke, but I swear, this is real. After I read the entire journal, I was thinking the same thing. I thought it was just a story, then even tried to brush it off as a joke, but my curiosity got the better of me, so I looked into it, and I even spent the rest of my vacation investigating the information in this journal. I mean if it was real, I had to know, or at least calm my fears and worries. What I found was far more terrifying than I had even imagined. Let's get back to the journal. It was written by a gift shop worker named Sarah who worked at the Old Faithful Basin store. She wrote that she was very friendly and would often chat with the customers about their vacations and such. She was so well liked apparently that she often got repeat visits from customers, sometimes just before they would leave or because they felt comfortable with her and she was honest. Whatever it was, Sarah was definitely not a wallflower by any means. She wrote that she began to notice visitors disappearing. 
She started to get concerned when visitors would ask about their missing relatives, although there were no missing persons listed in the daily bulletin. Apparently the day after they would be chastised for breaking a park rule by a park ranger, they would mysteriously disappear. Sarah wrote that the visitors would tell her that they reported their friend or family member missing to the park rangers, and a few hours later would be told that they were seen leaving the park. Yet the customers would often say they tried calling their missing companion, but just couldn't get a hold of them. She tried to calm their fears by telling them that there was often terrible cell service due to the mountains. Her worries started to grow as more and more people would go missing, yet not a single one of them would show up on the missing reports. It was at this point when she started to look into this strange event. Sarah began offering to keep a lookout for the missing person and traded phone numbers with the frantic families. Now I know what you are thinking. I looked into missing persons reports at Yellowstone, and none of the people listed missing in the journal are listed in the missing persons registry at the park. Not a single one of those people that she described is listed as missing in the park, yet the families swear up and down that they went missing in the park. I even asked myself when I called the Yellowstone Park Service claiming to be a journalist, and every time I mentioned one of the missing, and I mean every time, I was informed that particular person was seen leaving the park. Clearly there was more to this than the Park Service was willing to admit. I had decided to spend the rest of my summer vacation looking into this issue. Okay, so back to the journal. In the next section of the journal, Sarah said she started to look into these missing persons with a greater intensity spending her evenings researching each individual, trying to find any connections or links between them. She started questioning a few park rangers, asking simple questions such as, Have you heard about this person? Their family said they went missing from campground, eh? And, did you happen to see this person actually leave the park? After a couple of weeks of questioning the visitor disappearances, she came home to find a note pinned to her front door. When she read the note, she was shocked to find, Stop looking, you wouldn't want to lose that precious job you seem to love so much. This however only served to solidify her determination to investigate the disappearances. Clearly this wasn't just a tourist lost in the miles of park. Something sinister was actually going on. After a couple of weeks of investigating and finding no real leads, Sarah happened to overhear a couple of park rangers talking. Their hushed discussion seemed unusual prompting her to decide to follow them at the end of her shift. As soon as her shift ended, with her mind almost entirely focused on the mystery, she didn't even notice when she almost slammed into the back of same two rangers she overheard earlier, and after cheerfully saying something like, Oh, I am so sorry, I didn't see you. I will see you tomorrow, have a great night. She shuffled away quickly in the direction of the parking lot, as if to go to her car. The rangers seemed to ignore her presence as she continued down the path. Once she was sure they were not paying any attention to her, she ducked behind a tree and waited until they were almost out of sight before following them down the path. Being a gift shop employee, she was not used to the long hike, and after what seemed to her like miles, she began to become nervous as the sun was started to set behind the mountains, and yet the rangers never stopped. Sarah began to question her determination as thoughts of bear and bison attacks began to slip into her mind, since she saw daily reports of visitors having encounters, but she pushed them away and steeled her resolve, and continued her pursuit of the rangers. Hours later she crept along the path as the half-moon rose, casting an eerie glow in the darkness as she pursued the rangers. Sarah was starting to become convinced that the rangers were only checking the park after closing, and just as she started to turn around, she noticed a new light just over the rise. As she slipped from tree to tree, getting closer to her quarry, she began to notice the odor of sulfur and mixed with pine. She finally crested the rise and saw a cabin with an odd chimney in the center. Anxiety filled her as she debated getting closer to the cabin in order to see what was going on inside, but fear won the day and she retreated. It took nearly three hours to return, almost getting lost several times along the way. Once she reached the parking lot, she immediately drove home without stopping, constantly checking her review mirror, worried she might be followed. Thankfully, she never saw anyone follow her, and her fear and anxiety began to subside. Once she reached home, she breathed a sigh of relief and started to think the entire event over in her mind. 
Sarah wrote how determined she was to still look into what was going on and decided to use her day off to check out the cabin during the day. Apparently she was so excited and nervous, she slept fitfully, but woke up even more determined to solve the mystery. She wrote that she felt she was living one of those mystery books she loved to read. The next morning Sarah decided to skip her breakfast instead opting for a few protein bars. She also made certain she was dressed appropriately for the long hike to the cabin. After driving to the store parking lot, she decided that it might make the park rangers suspicious if they saw her car in the lot and not working, so she decided to park a bit further up the road, off a small, unmarked trail. She then hiked for several hours in the direction of the cabin, making sure she was alone and not seen by any park rangers. She didn't want to blow her chance to find out what was really going on. After almost three hours of hiking, Sarah was about to give up, and panic started to set in, thinking she had gotten herself lost in the miles of forest, when she finally crested a small rise and found the strange cabin again. The cabin was even more unusual in the day. It was roughly circular with a central chimney that still seemed to exhaust smoke that smelled awful. It was then she realized that it was not smoke but steam, and in flash of understanding, concluded that the cabin was built around a hot spring that wasn't listed on any of the park maps. The facade of the cabin was clearly the original, appearing to have been built at the turn of the century. The rest was definitely upgraded, looking no more than 10 years old. After spending the next hour watching every direction, and closely watching the lodge for any movement, she finally decided to get closer and find out what was going on. Sarah quickly crept up to the building, and looked into several windows just to be certain no one was around. After confirming that she was alone, she circled around to the main entrance. The door was unlocked, which surprised her. If this was park service property, or even Ussie's, the building should be locked when no one was on site. She almost decided to leave at that moment, but her curiosity got the best of her, and she pressed on. She swiftly opened the door and quickly closed it behind her, while tiptoeing down the entranceway. There was a room on the right and on the left before the main doors into the room surrounding the spring. She chose the room on the right first, hoping to find some sort of information relating to the building. Once she opened the door, she was shocked to find neatly folded stacks of clothing with a pair of shoes on top and the occasional hat, backpack, or purse. Many of the piles had a camera as well. It was done so well and so carefully, as if lovingly prepared, the image was shocking, reminding her of the old horror movies where the killer has a shrine of their victims. Sarah's heart started beating faster, and her breath caught in her throat as she looked around the room. There were dozens of neat stacks, maybe even 50. As she looked closer she noticed that the further down the line, the clothing became more dated, the rows ending in clothes from the turn of the century. It was clear something sinister was going on. Frantically, she began to search the clothing for any kind of identification, and yet, every single stack had nothing, even the cameras had no film or memory cards. She concluded that any identifying information was deliberately removed. Suddenly, a large bang echoed down the hall. Her heart jumped to her throat as she frantically looked around. Fearing that she might be caught, she bolted down the hall to the doors into the spring room. The moment she entered, a wall of oppressive heat overwhelmed her, and she nearly started to cough on the fumes of sulfur. Stifling a cough and a gag, she stumbled around, desperately searching for a place to hide. As she scanned the area, she saw a large path that led to the center of the pool, at the end a large altar. In a stroke of luck, she noticed a large enough space beneath the altar where she could hide. Quickly she wedged herself into the recess and waited. Sarah wrote that she waited for only a few short minutes before she began to hear voices and footsteps. As sweat began to drip into her eyes, she could hear the pleading of a young girl. I swear I won't ever jump the fence again. Just let me go. I promise I won't ever break another rule. I don't want to get in trouble. It was only maybe a minute when the pleading suddenly switched to a short shriek and desperate cries. Please no. I won't ever come back, I won't tell anyone, please, please, please. While the girl was begging for what seemed to be her life, Sarah started to notice a calm murmur of many voices. She wrote that she could hear what seemed like a prayer or a chant, but she could not make out any of the words. 
As she strained to hear what was being said over the girl's sobbing, suddenly the chant stopped, and after only a few heartbeats later, a loud blood-curdling scream that was quickly cut off following a splash. Sarah wrote that she was in a near panic attack, she had no idea what was going on, but she thought she had stumbled into a satanic cult murdering people. That thought was quickly extinguished when she felt a deep rumble, and then the heat became oppressive. A sudden thought that she would be steamed like a clam flashed through her mind, and then a disgusting odor became far more apparent. This was more than just the smell of sulfur, which she had become used to, it was like a thousand bodies were rotting, and fecal matter mixed with the smell of sulfur. Her stomach roiled, and she choked back bile. Out of nowhere, a deafening roar filled the enclosed room, that ended as quickly as it started. Sarah wrote she had no way of knowing if she would be caught, so she fought to remain absolutely silent. Seconds ticked by, and in only a few short minutes, the smell retreated, and the heat began to drop. She could now breathe more comfortably, but it still felt like a sauna. It was at that moment that the group began to chant anew. This was surprisingly brief, and once it was complete, she could hear the footsteps of the cult retreat. Sarah was concerned that if she got up too soon, she would be caught, so she waited for many long minutes. After nearly 30 minutes had passed without a single sound, Sarah slipped out of the crevice and quickly looked around. There was no one around her, and she then instinctively looked into the pool. It was just the same as it was when she arrived. Taking no chances, she quickly gathered her wits and bolted from the building. Exiting the cabin, the mountain air rapidly cooled the sweat that had drenched her clothing. At this point she was running on autopilot, sprinting her way back out of the woods towards her car her mind in shock. She was unsure what she just heard, and what the hell she had smelled. Maybe it was actually hell. She reached her car in record time, less than one-third of the time it took to reach the cabin. Her body shaking, she jumped into her car, and skidded out of the trail, onto the road, and back in the direction of her home. There is more to come, I will post more from her journal in a couple days. I need to look into this more. Something is going on. When I was just learning to hunt, there was an incident that forever etched a peculiar fear of deer into the core of my being. It happened during one of those early outings with my cousin, a seasoned hunter who had taken me under his wing to impart the skills and secrets of the trade. We were deep in the woods, the air crisp with the scent of pine and anticipation. The day was drawing to a close when my cousin expertly aimed and fired, bringing down a magnificent buck. The echo of the shot lingered in the air as we approached the fallen creature. Its majestic antlers sprawled across the forest floor, a testament to the wild beauty we had just conquered. As we started pulling the buck out of a ditch, something in my gut twisted. An uneasy feeling clawed at me, and I distinctly remember voicing my concern. Hey guys, I think that thing is alive. The others chuckled at what they thought was a novice hunter's nervous imagination. Little did we know, my gut feeling was eerily accurate. Before our startled eyes, the supposedly lifeless buck sprang back to a startling vitality. Panic ensued as the creature, now far from dead, thrashed wildly. In the chaos that ensued, the once docile animal turned into a furious force of nature. In a flash, it gored my cousin with a swift, unexpected movement that left us all dumbfounded. The buck, as if fueled by a last surge of energy, made its escape to the top of the hill before collapsing in its final moments of life. We stood there, a mixture of shock and adrenaline coursing through our veins. My cousin fortunately was okay, but the incident left an indelible mark on my psyche. From that day forward, a peculiar fear of deer gripped me whenever I ventured into the wilderness. The sight of those graceful creatures took on a different meaning, and the tranquility of the forest seemed tinged with an underlying tension. To cope with my newfound trepidation, I adopted a new hunting mantra one shot wasn't enough. Each time I aimed at a deer, I made sure to fire one more time before daring to approach and tag my prey. It became a ritual, a self-imposed insurance policy against the unexpected. As the years passed, the incident faded into the annals of memory, but the fear endured. 
My approach to hunting became a delicate dance between respect for the wild and a persistent wariness that lingered in the shadow of that fateful day. In the woods, I found solace in the rhythmic cadence of my shots, a self-imposed safeguard against the unexpected resurgence of life in the silent depths of the forest. This is not a hunting story, but definitely involves the woods and a horrifying experience. This happened to my mom, my stepdad, and my baby sisters. This was about 17 years ago, and I was not present for it, as I was at my dad's house for the weekend. But according to my mom, they were all driving back from Strawberry, Arizona, which is a gorgeous little forest town up near the Mogollon Rim. Dense, beautiful forest everywhere. As they're driving through the woods out of the town and down the mountain to head back to Phoenix, my mom says she sees headlights coming up behind them and coming up quick. She doesn't initially think anything of it until the car decides not to pass them and starts tailing them feverishly. She says they tried to drive faster, and he would speed up. They'd switch lanes, he would follow them, tailing them all the while. So my stepdad, possibly not being the most efficient in a scenario of great stress, decides to test the theory on whether or not this guy is actually following them by turning off onto a dirt road that led deeper into the dense forest. He said the road was definitely a clear path and that it was obvious it was a road, but that it was still covered with fairly good-sized rocks that made for an incredibly bumpy ride. So he turns off onto the dirt road. The guy follows him. At this point, my dad realizes he may have messed up big time and should have stayed on the main, big, paved road down the mountain. My sisters were asleep and at this point are awake, bobbing down the road heads flying everywhere because they were only about four at the time their twins, mom freaking out, and dad driving at lightning speed deep into the woods. My mom says they were going far, far faster than that road allowed for, and were afraid tires were going to start popping because of the rocks. The guy is behind them still, tailing them the entire way. From what I remember of the story, I believe the dirt road came to a dead end, probably because it ended at someone's property. If I remember correctly, this is when shit went from oh shit to we're gonna die. But luckily, my stepdad weaved in between some trees to make a U-turn possibly the fastest U-turn ever and raced back down the dirt road and out onto the main street. I can't remember if the guy tailing them never exited the woods to follow them, or if he did but drove off into the night on the main road. Either way, I was really scared for my family when they told me that story but also glad I wasn't there. But at the same time, I felt guilty I wasn't there, even though I know I couldn't have done anything to help them as a 9 or 10 year old kid. I was just glad they got home safe. I was sitting in a tree stand one night and had a buddy about one kilometer down the trail from me. I was at the end of the trail, he was close to the beginning, near the road. We knew if we spoke loud enough we could hear each other, but we didn't need to yell. We tried this during off-season to be sure. Anyways back to the story. These two tree stands are one way and one way out. No other trails and we knew his property like the back of our hands. No neighbors for miles around us. Windy day turned into a creepy sunset. Twilight came and all of a sudden everything just stopped on a dime. Super quiet nothing was moving. Dead still. Then all of a sudden I heard two young girls giggling and singing kids' songs. Kinda like, la 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 etc. Lasted about 20 minutes. Sounded like they were right over by my friend's stand. When it got dark I started to walk back when I passed his stand, and he was gone already. Met him back at the truck and asked him if he heard the singing. He said, nope it's been way too windy all day. I then realized the wind was still howling around us. So how did it go quiet where I was sitting, and I heard kids giggling? Still creeps me out. Went on a group RV camping trip in the middle of nowhere Arizona only to awake and hear something sniffing the outside of our tent. My immediate reaction was that it was likely a bear or some animal that came across our site and just maybe my dumbass friends didn't tie up the garbage. Seconds later, 
I can hear the sniffing go to the tent next to ours and everyone in mine grabs one another quietly to acknowledge we all were awake and were aware of what's happening outside. Moments later, a friend in another tent popped out and started to scream and make noise he had a gun too, hoping it would scare off whatever animal was in our sight. Turns out, it wasn't an animal. It was some guy who had gone through our coolers or food and also decided it'd be okay to sniff our tents. Our friend chased him off, and we immediately packed our shit and left. Edit. Alright, since this is floating at the top, I thought I'd a second creepy, camping story. A year after the above incident, my dumbass friends and I went back to the nearby area, thinking what we encountered was a one-time incident. This time, we thought we'd outsmart any possible creepers, and instead of camping in our tents, we all slept in the beds of our trucks and SUVs. Cause you know, they can't possible sniff a Toyota Tacoma. Anyways, it's the middle of the night, I'm passed out in the back of my SUV when I suddenly feel a bright light on my face. Naturally, I would have woken up, cussed and asked who was doing that. However, I instantly knew to pretend to be asleep and not let the individual know I was awake. I laid there next to my girlfriend, hoping she would do the same as I, and I kept an ear out for any unusual sounds like sniffing. All I could hear was a friend snoring by the campfire. After the light left my car, I heard the person walk to the next truck and shine his light on my friends in there. I slowly looked up and it ended up being some older guy, just standing there staring at everyone while they slept. I waited until he left the campsite and I busted my ass out of that truck and woke up my friends, most of which had also been pretending to sleep and realized what was going on. I was hunting elk by myself in the Desolation Hunting Unit. I headed into the mountains on what I know as the Desolation Creek Road. Several miles up, a bridge crosses the creek. At this point, I headed toward Desolation Butt, but as daylight was running low, I pulled over in a wide spot and set up my backpacking tent. I ate a cold meal and climbed into my sleeping bag. Lighting my lantern, I left it just outside and read for quite some time with my head slightly out of the entrance. At some point, I fell asleep, dozing for several hours. Sometime between 2-3, I was jolted awake the lantern still burning. I found myself questioning what had awakened me when a piercing scream, yell, or whatever you want to call it reverberated in the timber. I doused the lantern as it made it so that I could not see, blinded by the light as it were. At this point, it happened again. I grabbed my 357 and strained my eyes attempting to see what the noise maker looked like. My thought has always been that maybe it was a Bigfoot, as I have heard cougars, elk, bears, and all manner of critters, and this didn't sound like any of them. I joined your site not long ago, and upon listening to your sound files, holy crap, that was what I heard. I fired the lantern up and proceeded to stand sentry in my tent and bag with the 357 at the ready but only heard it a couple more times at diminishing volume as though it was on the move. Eventually, I fell back asleep, awaking to dawn's early light, as they say. With the light of day, thoughts soon turned to elk hunting, and I pretty much forgot about the earlier ruckus. I drove off toward Desolation Butt, but found myself distracted by Kelsey Meadows. I followed game trails out to the base of Kelsey Butt, and followed an old closed logging road that curled around the butt. At some point, I became acutely aware of a total lack of any sound, it was really creepy. Then, the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I got the feeling that I was being watched. At this point, the early morning ruckus came back to mind with a vengeance, and I got the hell out of there. I covered a good three miles in record time. I may have just been hypersensitized, but who knows. I figured any details that might help. While riding our bicycles on the outskirts of town, we took an old side road but ran into a deep puddle. We stopped there, fearing a cold, wet, muddy trip home if we dared to ride on through. Suddenly, a break in the clouds let a beam of light reach the forest floor in a second growth forest approximately 40 years old, which illuminated the creature. It turned and walked up the ruts in the road that were 8 inches deep, 10 inches wide, and had water flowing down towards us. When it was out of sight, we regained the ability to move. 
I don't think either of us could have run if it came at us. We never felt danger, but the fear was so overwhelming it affected my sleeping habits for years, causing me to sneak into my sister's closet in the middle of the house. The four of us boys shared a room that had a rectangular window at my eye level on the top bunk. This happened long ago, and I'm posting partly so that myself and others in the area, whom I've just read about on here since I found this site, won't feel like freaks. But I remember it like it was yesterday, and I always will. My friend Greg's dad lived in a very nice, newer at the time house at the end of a cold de sac in Damascus. Myself, my friend Greg, and two other friends spent the night there when we were all in our early teens 13, 14. We were not good kids, and as we started to party his dad was away, Greg, laughing, told us we should go call for the OE monster. Apparently, kids in the area or just Greg knew about something they called the OE monster that lived in the woods to the north that could often be heard making a sound or yell like, well, OE. Anyway, his dad's house had a huge deck on the back north side of the house overlooking the large grass backyard that was bordered on the end and on the right by woods. So we took our beers and stood on the deck, taking turns yelling OE out into the woods, laughing and joking. We started just pre-dusk, and after about half an hour, Greg started pointing and laughing, saying, See, I told you guys. About 50 feet out, standing right on the edge of the woods on the right side of the yard, was a short about 5-5 five, five half feet, white or grey shape slowly swaying from side to side. We all leaned out over the deck to get a better look, and at first, I didn't see it but did within about two minutes. My other two friends were pointing and getting kind of freaked out. They sobered up pretty quickly. I felt a rush like no other, and everything is imprinted in my memory vividly. Greg was still laughing and started yelling OE some more. The thing made some sounds almost like an inquisitive cat PRRR, but more like oh, kind of softly. After about 10 minutes, Greg thought that we should go try to see it closer, and started trying to slowly walk down the steps to the yard, while drunk. After a minute of hesitation, we followed though I was kinda scared. But we lost sight of it as we went down the steps, and when we got to the yard, it wasn't there anymore. We ran to where it had been, and we thought we heard some brush crashing in the woods, or at least I did. Greg acted as if he wanted to go into the woods after it, but none of us were going to, so I think he was secretly relieved. The next morning, the first thing we did was go to where it had been standing. There were a few gopher mounds around, and right in the middle of the loose dirt of a gopher mound was a bare footprint, really wide we didn't measure it. I would estimate the print to be about 7 foot 8 long, and almost just as wide right under the toes. There were four distinct toe prints, clear as day, while the little toe seemed to have not been in the dirt of the mound, but on the grass. The depth was deepest around the base of the toes or ball of the foot, maybe one quarter in the thickest part of the dirt tapering to maybe one eight by the heel, which was close to the grass. We went into the woods right at that spot, and followed a little trail to a small stream that ran along parallel to the yard about 20-30 yards into the woods. While we thought we saw many things like imprints, broken branches, etc. We didn't see anything more that was clearly from the night before. One moonlit night in winter at 7.20 p.m., a practical and down-to-earth retired solicitor's clerk, Miss Bertha Humphreys of North Walsham in Norfolk, stumbled upon the inexplicable. She recalls, It had been snowing heavily, and when I took my little dog for his evening walk, the ground was thickly carpeted with snow, so I decided to go for a short walk down one side of the road and up the other. Sooty was on a lead, and at the bottom of the Mundusley Road where she resides near Crow's Lane, they crossed and returned on the other side, walking slowly because it was slippery underfoot, she recounts. I glanced ahead, and at the top of the road where it swerves at the bend, I saw a dull, red glow moving above the ground from side to side. At first I thought it was the rear lights of a car reversing. Then the glowing still persisted moving, I thought possibly it was snow spots I was seeing just as one sees sunspots. I rubbed my eyes we walked on. Then I stopped and stared, 
as the object had now emerged from the narrow part of the road and was floundering along. It was a jet black oblong shape, dark and bat-like, and in the center was a circle of dull red light. I stood still, mystified when the next thing I knew it was coming towards me slowly and taking up the complete crown of the road. When it reached the wider section of the road, near the Orchard Garden's public house, it floundered and fluttered and slowly rose into the air across the open space until it reached the housetop level, the red circle still glowing and the black shape flapping and billowing like a cloak. Then I observed it was dragging behind, as it were the tail of a kite, a miniature of itself black, oblong, with a glowing red circle in the center. It stayed for a second or two at rooftop level, then with renewed effort shot up to a much higher level, floating again. Then it shot up higher still and disappeared in the clouds. All this was in complete silence as the object made no noise whatsoever, although it struggled hard to get airborne. It would seem that the object got caught in the narrow section of the road, as the red glowing was drifting from side to side. It was not until it came floundering to the wider part that I could see its shape, which took the form of an oblong sail, and it floated towards me. After it became airborne and had disappeared from sight, a gentleman came along. I asked him if he had seen an unusual object in the sky. He unfortunately had been gazing down watching his step, as it was very dangerous walking. He had seen nothing and suggested that the object might be something sent out from the radar station to warn ships. Needless to say, I did not tell how the object became airborne and that it had previously been floundering along the Mundusley Road. She told no one of her uncanny experiences as she was sure that nobody would believe her, but stressed it was perfectly true. She later wrote to the Astronomer Royal about the incident, but no response was forthcoming. I can hardly believe what I am about to recount, but I swear that every word is true. It all began after a violent thunderstorm had swept through Yosemite National Park, leaving the once serene landscape changed in ways that would forever haunt me. As a park ranger named Joseph, my duty was to protect and care for the park's natural beauty. After the storm, I noticed something peculiar in a specific area of the park. The pine trees emitted an eerie, otherworldly sound, like a chorus of mournful whispers. It sent shivers down my spine, but I assumed it was merely a consequence of the storm's fury. One night, I found myself patrolling that very area, drawn by a strange curiosity that I couldn't shake off. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the air grew thick with an unnatural silence, broken only by the haunting melody of the pine tree's unsettling symphony. My flashlight pierced through the darkness, revealing gnarled roots and damp leaves underfoot. And then, there was an unknown cryptid stumbling and waddling through the shadows. The sight of it made my stomach churn with fear and disgust. The creature's movements were awkward, dragging its leg ever so often as it shuffled forward. The glimpse I caught of its facial features made me cringe and shudder. Its face, if I could even call it that, appeared male, but it was disfigured and ghastly skinny. The jaw seemed to hang unnaturally, giving it a hauntingly macabre appearance. Its eye sockets were surrounded by massive bags that made the eyes themselves appear empty and lifeless. The creature's mouth was wide open, looking hollow and void of any humanity. It had no clothes, its deathly skinny form exposed to the elements. The most shocking aspect of the cryptid was its height. I couldn't believe my eyes, it was freakishly tall, towering over anything I had ever seen. Its demeanor and appearance were incredibly dirty, possibly white, but obscured by a layer of filth. As I stood there, paralyzed with fear and disbelief, the creature turned its empty gaze toward me. Panic welled up inside me, but before I could react, it lunged at me with surprising speed and strength. Its bony fingers gripped my shoulders, and we tumbled to the forest floor. The impact knocked the breath out of me, and before I could regain my composure, darkness enveloped me. When I regained consciousness, I found myself alone, sprawled on the forest floor. The cryptid was gone, as if it had never been there. I rubbed my throbbing head, trying to make sense of what had just happened. Had I encountered a ghostly apparition, 
a creature of the dark depths of the forest, or had my mind played tricks on me? Fear mingled with confusion as I stumbled back to my feet, feeling the weight of the encounter pressing on my mind. My heart raced with a mix of disbelief and a primal urge to flee. But when I returned to the park ranger station and reported the incident, my colleagues looked at me skeptically. They assured me that the storm had probably left me disoriented, and that what I had seen was likely a figment of my imagination. Yet deep down, I knew the truth. I had encountered something beyond rational explanation, something that existed in the shadows of the world, unseen and unheard by most. I'll preface this by saying I now live in Melbourne, Australia, but I lived in California for three years between 2015-2018, and I've got a story. My potential skinwalker encounter was in September 2016. I had finished summiting Mount Whitney, California, and had been doing months of training to do it. Early in the evening, when I got back down from the mountain, I went into Lone Pine to get some food and get ready for the drive back to L.A. But before that I went to the Alabama Hills scenic area just out of town to sit and eat some food and marvel at the 14,000 feet mountain I had just summited with my team. They were still in the town center. As the sun set, I turned to the side and behind a small hill was an old homeless looking man in ragged clothes and grimy hair. He stood there slightly slumped and motionless. Inside my mind I was shitting myself because to me, Something seemed extremely off and my gut feeling was telling me to get out of there. But I tried to stay composed and asked him if he wanted any food or needed anything. He stayed as still as a statue and didn't respond. I gave him a few more options to respond before telling him I'm not staying here any longer and I started to move back to my car. I hurried up the process quickly and started the engine. Put my seatbelt on. When I looked back up the man wasn't there, and instead it was now a half-deformed looking coyote, which made an ear-piercing scream and stood on its hind legs. It would have been six feet I backed it in reverse and floored it out of there, and it kept up with me for at least two hundred meter. I'm pretty much convinced that it was a skinwalker. I know they're technically only in Utah or Arizona, but these things probably don't know what borders are and I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up in California and Nevada as well. I was at Page Mountain Snow Park with about nine or ten others campers. We were just camping out for the weekend and having a good time. We, while exploring the area on a previous trip, had come across a mine. It was marked with a mine claim paper and a jar hanging from a tall stick in the ground. We went to the Josephine County Clerk to find out what other mining claims are in the area with interest in filing a claim ourselves, if an abandoned claim was in the area. It turns out that there are four or five claims directly in front of the cabin. On the night we saw it, we had arrived at the cabin after dark and set up camp. We had a little map of the area this time, and after a few beers around the campfire we decided, me and three or four other guys, to grab some flashlights and take a look in the woods. The girls stayed back at the cabin, and we guys went down the road in two Suzuki Samurais. We left the Samurais running with headlights on facing toward us and the cabin. We couldn't see the cabin from there. The woods are very dense, and it was a ways off. We were laughing and making a lot of noise as we circled through the dense area. We got almost to the cabin when we decided to turn back and retrieve our rigs which we couldn't even hear at this point. I personally got a very strange feeling that something was watching us. I began to feel very uncomfortable, but didn't say anything. Soon we were able to hear the Samurai's engines running. They were both very loud with exhaust leaks to boot. We ended up making a very wide circle back to the rigs and ended up on a ridge looking down at the Samurai's. Probably 50 or 60 feet higher in elevation and maybe 250 feet away. We had to descend a steep slope to arrive at the rigs, and we decided to chill out and rest for a minute before we headed down. I lit a cigarette as did others and was looking down at the Samurais when something huge and hairy walked between us and the headlights. 
We all saw it as it first passed in front of my rig blocking the headlights completely where it stood for just a second. Long enough for everyone to see it. Then it passed by the other samurai in one large step blocking the headlights. All I could really see was that it was furry, brown or black. This I could see in the light of the headlights, but because it was between us and the light we couldn't make out a shape at all. The only thing we could tell was that it had no fear at all of those noisy samurais or the headlights, and that it was tall. From where we were standing it would have to be at least five feet tall to block the headlights from our view. If it were a bear, which is what we all agreed to that night, then why would it walk right past those samurais? Why would it walk in front of them instead of behind them? Way would it be walking upright? I don't know much about bears, but I don't think they are that tall while on all fours. Whatever it was, I'm convinced that it was watching the girls at our cabin when we unexpectedly crashed through the woods scaring it out. Our decision to suddenly crash through the woods could not have been expected by the creature. We caught it by surprise, but it wasn't running away. It walked away slowly, and it didn't know there weren't any people in those rigs. If there had been then, they would have gotten the fright of their life. Because as I mentioned before, it paused in front of the headlights for a second. We all spent a very scary night at the cabin. We didn't let this experience run us off. But we all felt like we were being watched as we slept. We all agreed that it was a bear and didn't discuss it again for a few years. Until the other night, one of my friends, who was with us that night, told me out of the blue that he thinks it was a Sasquatch. Well, since he said it first, I agreed, but none of us have discussed that night since. I was deer hunting on the east slope of a very steep hillside and saw movement about 70 yards down and away from me. I started to bring my rifle up, but realized it was too dark and tall to be a deer. I saw this thing walk through the trees, and even though it was very dry and crunchy in the woods, it made no sound. I saw it walk very briskly for about 40 yards, and then turn down the slope and out of sight. Also noticed, the following day in an area a few miles away we found unusually large dung piles full of berry remains and my hunting partner, and I thought they were from a very big and even then thought it would be difficult for a bear to pass such a large diameter stool. Almost a year ago, I was an opener at a resort, clocking in before 5 a.m. each day. The resort is located inside of an affluent neighborhood in a very wealthy town suburb. Employees had to park in one of two parking lots at either ends of the property, and the lot I chose was adjacent to a long and windy road outside the resort which lead to the rest of the neighborhood. The road and resort were separated by a short range of brush and trees that no one ever walked through. I'd arrived one morning per usual and put the car into park with my headlights still on. The lights in the lot weren't ever on in the morning since no one else really showed up before 6 a.m. when the sun was out, so it was usually always dark at the start of my walk. Save for security, I was one of the first employees to arrive on the property each morning and was usually completely alone in this particular parking lot at this time. This morning didn't seem any different. I had my hand literally at my keys, my brain in the process to turn off my car, when I noticed a young girl, maybe like 14 or 15 years old, come scampering her body language was the exact definition. Run with quick light steps, especially through fear or excitement. Through the span of trees that separates the resort from the outside road. She was directly in front of my car, and my headlights illuminated a clear view of her in the pitch black. She looked like she was in high school, had long, blonde hair, and was wearing a jacket with pajamas, maybe, like she'd just walked out of a house. One thing about her that bothered me was that she wouldn't stop laughing and smiling. I couldn't hear her laughing from outside the car, but she was visually giggling at something I wasn't aware of or could see, and it was so unnatural. She occasionally glanced behind her as if someone else were there waiting away from the headlights. She then waved at me like it were a normal gesture at this time, and then immediately ran to my passenger side door. 
This all happened in a matter of seconds, and I wasn't really sure what was even happening besides my anxiety spiking. I know I simultaneously yanked the aux from my phone to shut whatever song had been playing off while grabbing for the lock button. I remember feeling panic for never remembering if it's up or down to lock when the girl began pulling violently and incessantly on the door handle on the passenger's side. I realized because I didn't turn my car off, it had stayed locked. She began pounding on the window, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs for her to leave before pressing on my horn. I could see her laughing outside like this were some type of game, as if I were a silly friend not letting her in as a joke. After a few seconds, she stopped the pounding and trying to open my car door. Her face fell flat like I disappointed her, and she started to walk away from my car back the way she came. She waved at me again before squeezing through the trees, out of the view of my headlights. This whole encounter confused me almost as much as it scared me. Most people I told the story to just chalked it up to her being on drugs, but that narrative hasn't felt right to me despite her behavior. Maybe she was just being an extremely out-of-touch teenager whose parents need a firmer grip on her. My first thought was possibly human trafficking, but I'm not sure if that would fit this scenario as I'm not the most well-versed with the subject. I told someone when I made it to LP, but they didn't seem to care much. I didn't call the police and I regret that. I'll never get out of my brain though how messed off the feeling was watching a stranger, seemingly alone, pop out from the trees in the darkness laughing, and then try to violently enter your car in an empty parking lot. I do think the possibility of someone else being present the whole time is a lot more scary, and I wonder who else was there and where exactly. Not a responder, but lived next door to one who is very famous in our hometown for his alien abduction but there are other stories too. This all went down in the 80s, rural England, and my memory of the exact details are fuzzy been a while since anyone has bothered discussing it, small hometown and everyone knows and is over it. The alien abduction story is that he was on the way back from a call out, saw some odd lights on the road ahead and had to stop, a one track road. He went to investigate the lights as any good police officer does, and next thing he knows it's a half hour later, and he's back in his car seat, car facing the other way, some odd substance on him, no lights to be seen. The police dispatch also confirmed that his radio frequency just disappeared for that half hour. The substance was tested and didn't match any known profile. I really have no idea what that really means or what tests were. At around the same time, this officer and some others were called out by a farmer whose cows had disappeared. Yes, very stereotypical cows in a tractor beam story. But the farmer reported them missing, multiple police show up, gate is locked and no cows. They all decide to drive around looking for the cows. The paranormal magnet officer reports the thing where you keep trying to drive somewhere, but always end up back where you were when it shouldn't be possible on his route but they all convene back at the field at the end of shift. The cows are back, though none of the officers found them and nobody called in to find them. And remember, paranormal officer has seemingly been driving past the field on a loop all night. The farmer was also unaware when they called to ask him. Totally sounds like the farmer pulled a prank, except it was raining that night and there was loads of wet mud building at the edge of the field where the gate is and not footprints or hoof prints, and the cows were dry too. The last story I have the vaguest recollection of, I think it happened some years earlier and the paranormal officer was called to the discovery site. It is mostly about a different guy, a farmhand who was an immigrant who disappeared without a trace, and then appeared several days later and miles away, dead, with burns and another unidentifiable substance all over his body, dumped at the top of a pile of coal. Again, no sign of anyone climbing up the very precarious pile of coal, and no sightings of this farmhand getting from the farm to a different town one road, and he didn't seem to be on it at any point. He was in the same clothes, but appeared to have undressed then been redressed by someone else. Autopsy couldn't find a cause of death, it wasn't the burns, and he was like, 
barely dead no rigor mortis when discovered. Edit. Should probably add that the official answer to the farmhand death was spontaneous ball lightning, itself a weird theory, and it doesn't explain most of the situation. I am not saying aliens, but everyone at home is mildly convinced of the aliens. My somewhat scary moment was when I was camping at my very remote recreational 160-acre ranch, which I did almost every weekend and usually alone. I was actually in a small toy hauler that is left there. I was sleeping with the ramp down to enjoy the crisp air. My bunk is right there where the ramp was open. It was totally black out, no moon. I could not see past my arm. I sleep very light and always have my 357 caliber at my side and a shotgun or a R-15 nearby. Something woke me and there was the foulest smell coming from the ramp area of the trailer mere feet away. I quickly got up with pistol in hand and seconds later by the time I was armed and shined a spotlight outside, whatever it was took off. Not sure what is was, but there are tons of blackies out there I have seen. Most likely a snooping bear, but that smell I will never forget. It must have been pretty darn close for me to get such a strong odor from whatever it was. I bought battery-operated motion detectors and motion lights and put them in strategic places to alert me with more advance notice should that happen again. Those motion detectors came in handy on more than one occasion when it involved people poachers walking in. I personally feel safer when it is pitch black, don't know why, but I never sleep with a light on or with any illumination at all if I can help it. I just feel safer in pitch black. Mostly because I don't want people to see any light from a distance and come into my camp. I just feel vulnerable with a light on, remote, but there are people who show up from time to time nearby, as there is a campground about a half mile from my pad and honestly, I fear people far more than animals in remote forest land. I was the first speaker at the meeting, and I started by introducing myself, Joe Robb, and my wife Kelly who accompanies me on most of my field excursions. I shared with the audience that I had come across several Bigfoot tracks near the Nihilum River, close to the Tillamook National Forest boundary in coastal Oregon. I stumbled upon what could only be considered as a Bigfoot highway, where over a hundred tracks were found in one particular area. These tracks were found both uphill and downhill and belonged to six different big feet that were present at one time or another over a six-week period. I discovered the site while deer hunting during the weekend of Oct. 21-22-1996. There were even some diggings in the soil, which may or may not have been done by Bigfoot. I went back to the area two weeks later and found some broken alder trees and new tracks. On Labor Day weekend, my wife and I heard the snap of a tree and five human-like steps. I quickly grabbed my video camera, but unfortunately, I wasn't quick enough to get a picture of the creature that disappeared into a thicket that was only about 60 feet away. I didn't dare venture into the thicket. At the meeting, I displayed castings of two tracks that I had taken. One track was 16 half inches and the other was 12 half inches. Unfortunately, a nine-half-inch track was not plaster-casted. Interestingly, a scar on the sixteen-half-inch track was noted when it reappeared ten miles away in a different location. Henry Franzoni also spoke at the meeting and mentioned that an eighty-year-old Indian woman had shared a tale of wild woman and wild man in the same area dating back to about 1870. This was documented in the book, Nihilum Tillamook Tales, I explained that I had visited the area many times and had recorded various tracks. This indicates that various creatures are passing through the area in winter and summer. I've always felt a certain connection to the Amazon rainforest, so when I received the assignment to investigate the strange occurrences in a remote village, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement. As a government official, I had dealt with my fair share of unusual cases, but none had ever taken me to the heart of the jungle. Upon my arrival, I could feel the tension hanging in the air. 
the villagers, belonging to a tribe of about 30 people, had experienced a horrific attack. Seven of their own had been killed, and many more were wounded. The survivors recounted their harrowing ordeal, describing a large creature that resembled a giant dog standing on its hind legs. They spoke of massive claws, teeth, and fangs that glistened in the moonlight. As I listened to their stories, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something unnatural about this creature. Locals reported that it was taller than a man, at least two meters in height, and possessed terrifying strength and speed. The villagers were understandably terrified to stay alone at night, and many had fled their homes for safety. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I ventured into the rainforest with a small team of locals, armed with whatever weapons we could find. We searched for any signs of the creature, but it seemed to have vanished without a trace. The jungle was eerily quiet, and I couldn't help but feel that we were being watched. As night fell, we decided to set up camp and wait for the creature to reveal itself. We huddled around the fire, sharing stories and trying to ease the tension. But deep down, we all knew that we were in great danger. Suddenly, we heard a guttural growl coming from the darkness. It was close. Our hearts raced as we gripped our weapons, eyes scanning the shadows for any sign of the beast. Then it emerged. The creature was even more terrifying than the villagers had described. A massive, black, dog-like being with enormous claws and fangs that glinted in the firelight. It stood on its hind legs, towering over us, and let out a deafening roar. Instinct took over, and we fought for our lives. The creature was fast and powerful, but we managed to land a few blows. Bloodied and beaten, it retreated into the darkness, leaving us shaken but alive. We returned to the village, relieved to have survived the encounter. The government dispatched additional support to protect the villagers, and we shared our findings with the world. My name is Ben, and I'm a member of the local Native American community. I have always had a fascination with the legends and stories of the creatures that roam the forests of our land. So when I heard about Frank's track records, I knew I had to see them for myself. Frank, who is not a Native American, had stumbled upon tracks in two separate locations that he believed belonged to the elusive creature that our people have long known as Sasquatch. He had even managed to cast one of the tracks, which was about 15 inches long and had three toes with apparent webbing between them. As I examined the casts, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and wonder. These tracks could be the key to unlocking the mystery of Sasquatch, a creature that has been a part of our people's folklore for generations. But as I looked closer, I noticed something that gave me pause. The tracks were not quite like any I had seen before. They were certainly large, but the shape and arrangement of the toes seemed different from what I had come to expect from Sasquatch tracks. I couldn't help but wonder if there was something else at play here. I decided to do some investigating of my own, reaching out to members of my community who had knowledge of the land and its creatures. Through their help, I was able to track down a local elder who had some insight into the matter. The elder told me that there were stories of a different creature that roamed these lands, one that was said to have webbed feet and a tendency to live near bodies of water. He spoke of a creature that was known as the Water Man a being that our people had long considered to be a powerful and mysterious force of nature. As I listened to the Elder's words, I couldn't help but wonder if there was a connection between these tracks and the Waterman. It was possible that Frank had stumbled upon evidence of a creature that was not Sasquatch, but something entirely different. I knew that there was still much work to be done to unravel the mystery of these tracks, but I felt a renewed sense of purpose in my investigation. Whether they belonged to Sasquatch or the Water Man, these tracks represented a chance to learn more about the secrets that lay hidden within the forests of our land. And as a member of the Native American community, it was my duty to uncover those secrets and protect the land and its creatures for future generations. I'm Mark, and among my fellow truckers, I'm known for having an uncanny ability to sense danger on the road. 
It's a skill that has served me well over the years, helping me avoid accidents and stay safe during my long hauls. But one rainy night, my instincts would be put to the ultimate test. As the rain pounded against the windshield, I saw a figure standing by the side of the road, drenched and seemingly stranded. Despite the storm, there was something about her that caught my attention. Her name was Emily, and she claimed to be on her way to visit her family, but her unease was palpable. I hesitated for a moment, questioning whether it was wise to pick up a hitchhiker in such weather, but something in her eyes tugged at my heartstrings. I decided to trust my gut and offered her a ride. As Emily climbed into the cab of my truck, I noticed that she was shivering, her clothes clinging to her soaked form. I handed her a blanket I kept for emergencies, and she smiled gratefully, though her eyes remained haunted. As we drove through the stormy night, I tried to make small talk to ease the tension. I shared stories from my years on the road, hoping to distract both of us from the weather and the eerie silence that enveloped us. But as Emily began to speak, her words sent a chill down my spine. She confessed that she had died on this very highway years ago, in a tragic accident during a storm not unlike the one we were currently facing. She claimed to be a restless spirit, forever bound to the road, unable to move on to the afterlife. My skepticism kicked in, and I thought it was a scare tactic or a joke, but her eyes held an intensity that made me question my doubts. The radio signals started to flicker, playing distorted snippets of songs, and static filled the cab. Glancing at Emily, I saw her smile widen, but it lacked warmth. Her demeanor had changed, and her once friendly presence now felt sinister. The truck's engine sputtered, and the windows fogged up, revealing creepy messages written in the condensation. Get out now. Turn back while you still can. I couldn't comprehend what was happening. It felt like a nightmare, but I couldn't wake up. Fear gnawed at my resolve, and I decided to pull over, thinking it was better to let Emily out and end this strange encounter. But as I turned my attention to her, she was gone, vanished into thin air, leaving behind nothing but an eerie trail of wet footprints leading into the dark woods. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what had just occurred. I questioned my own sanity, wondering if the stress and exhaustion had taken a toll on my mind. Was I hallucinating, or had I truly encountered a ghostly hitchhiker? I continued my journey, trying to shake off the encounter as a bizarre coincidence. But the more I drove, the more I felt a presence lingering in the truck. The radio kept malfunctioning, and I saw fleeting glimpses of ghostly apparitions on the roadside. It was as if Emily's restless spirit had followed me, seeking something I couldn't fathom. Haunted by uncertainty and fear, I decided to seek answers. I delved into local legends and tales of tragic accidents on the highway, hoping to find a connection to Emily's story. What I discovered sent a shiver down my spine Emily's tale was true. She had indeed died on this road, and her restless spirit had been trapped ever since. Her malevolent intentions were born out of anger and despair, seeking revenge on the living for her untimely demise. Determined to put an end to Emily's torment and find closure for myself, I sought help from a local paranormal expert. Together, we performed a ritual to guide her spirit to the afterlife, allowing her to finally find peace. As the ritual concluded, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. The malevolent presence in my truck dissipated, leaving behind a sense of calm I hadn't felt in days. Emily's spirit was finally at rest, and I had come to terms with the unexplainable events I had experienced. Though the memories of that rainy night on the highway still send shivers down my spine, I can't help but wonder if there are forces beyond our understanding in this world. And while I may never fully comprehend what I encountered, I know one thing for certain sometimes, the scariest things are the ones we can't explain. The darkness of the forest seemed to press in on us, suffocating us in its chilling embrace. I found myself leading a small group of fellow hikers deeper into this remote and mysterious wilderness. The allure of the unknown had drawn us in, but now, as we confronted the malevolent cryptid, 
we couldn't help but question the wisdom of our decision. As we pressed on, the forest seemed to come alive with a sinister energy. The trees whispered with an otherworldly voice, and the air carried an indescribable malevolence. The cryptid's presence loomed over us, a grotesque fusion of human and beast that had haunted this forest for centuries. Despite my determination to survive and my newfound camaraderie with the other hikers, fear gnawed at the edges of my mind. The cryptid's attack on me still haunted my nightmares, leaving me battered and traumatized. Each step forward felt like a gamble with fate, a dance with the unknown that could spell our doom. Our group had managed to learn some of the cryptid's patterns and weaknesses during our time in the forest, but we knew that our advantage was only fleeting. The creature was cunning, and we couldn't shake the feeling that it was toying with us, leading us further into its dark domain. As the nights passed, the forest seemed to come alive with a cacophony of eerie sounds. The deafening silence of the day was replaced by rustling leaves, distant howls, and that unnerving otherworldly call that seemed to taunt us from the shadows. Together, we faced countless trials and tribulations navigating treacherous terrain, foraging for food, and constantly watching our backs for signs of the lurking cryptid. We became a tight-knit group, bound together by a shared fear of the unknown and a determination to survive. But as we inched closer to the heart of the forest, we realized that the cryptid was not the only malevolent force at play. There were other dark entities hidden within the forest's depths, lurking in the shadows and feeding off the fear and despair that hung in the air like a tangible fog. The more we uncovered about the cryptid's existence, the more we realized that its imprisonment was not just a matter of chance. An ancient curse seemed to have bound it to this forsaken place, a curse that demanded a terrible sacrifice in return for its freedom. Our hearts sank as we came to understand the full extent of the cryptid's malevolence. It had been trapped in the forest for centuries, and we were now standing on the precipice of a decision that could change the fate of the world. Should we leave the creature imprisoned, or risk releasing it and unleashing an ancient evil upon the world once more? As the climactic battle for survival drew near, we could feel the forest closing in on us, suffocating us in its darkness. The cryptid's presence loomed larger than ever, and we knew that our very lives depended on the choices we would make. In the heart of the forest, the final confrontation awaited us. With our hearts pounding and our minds racing, we stood united against the darkness, prepared to face our deepest fears and confront the malevolent cryptid. But what we didn't realize was that the forest itself was a living, breathing entity, and the cryptid was just one manifestation of its malevolence. As we battled for our lives, the ancient curse that bound the creature to the forest revealed its true purpose to feed off the fear and despair of those who dared to tread into its domain. In a nightmarish revelation, we understood that the only way to truly defeat the cryptid and break the curse was to confront the darkness within ourselves. It was not just the cryptid that held us captive, it was our own fears and doubts that shackled us to this forsaken place. As we faced our inner demons, we discovered the strength to banish the cryptid and break the ancient curse. The forest, once a prison of terror, began to release its hold on us, and we emerged into the sunlight, forever changed by our harrowing ordeal. I've always loved hunting and being out in the wilderness. There's something about the solitude and raw beauty of nature that just calls to me but my last trip to the New Mexico border for deer hunting was different from any other trip I've taken. I had seen numerous drug smugglers and their spotters throughout my days in the wilderness. It was a stark reminder of the dangers that lurk in these remote areas. But it was one particular night that still sends shivers down my spine. I was sitting in my tippy, enjoying my dinner and reflecting on the craziness I had seen over the past few days. Suddenly, I heard a heavy sniffing pattern outside the tippy. It was as if something was trying to smell my dinner, and it was going to town doing it. I froze mid-bite and listened to the sound for a few minutes. Then, I decided to growl at whatever was outside. I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew it wasn't a hungry drug smuggler. My mind raced, and I wondered if it could be a mountain lion. 
but the huffing was too loud, so I figured it was just some javelina since their tracks were everywhere. Despite my attempts to rationalize the situation, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. The fact that I was in a small tippy in the middle of nowhere with something sniffing around outside was a scary thought. I tried to ignore it, but the feeling of being watched lingered on. I love the feeling of being out in the wild, but this experience made me realize the dangers that come with it. The remote wilderness is not only home to beautiful creatures, but also dangerous ones. My mind wandered back to the drug smugglers, and I realized that I didn't want any kind of encounter with people in these remote areas either. As I sat there, my mind racing with thoughts, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief when the sniffing finally stopped. But the experience had left its mark on me, and I couldn't shake off the feeling of being hunted. I knew I needed to be more cautious and alert when I ventured out into the wilderness, and I made a mental note to always be prepared for anything that could happen. My friend and I used to go to South Padre Island every summer because his dad lived there. We were usually left to our own devices and would stay out late trying to pick up girls one night we're walking home from the beach, and we both notice a light on the dock flicker on. There was a figure standing out there under the light. It was far enough away we couldn't make out details, but the water was really misty that night and it seemed very eerie. We decide to pick up our pace and get home quickly. Just as we start walking briskly, the light we're under turns off. We sprint as fast as we can and the lights kept turning off and then back on after we get past them. We made it home and both locked every door to the house we could find. I still have no idea what that was about, but I do know salt air causes havoc on electrical equipment. Maybe it was that. I lived in a small, but not terribly isolated, town in central Alabama. My family lived in a trailer park near a small patch of woods with a railroad track running through the middle. I was driving home one night, late, maybe 12 one in the morning. As I'm driving up to the tracks, preparing to stop, I see what I originally believed to be a big buck standing at the edge of the woods on the opposite side of the road near the stop sign at the train tracks. So as I come to a stop, I angle my car slightly so my headlights shine on him. I wanted to get a good look at him because he was massive and I wanted to count his points. As my headlights fall over him, I realize what I'm seeing is, in fact, not a buck, but what appears to be a huge wolf, and I got a great look at it. My headlights lit him up perfectly. He didn't run off or anything. He just stood there, not motionless like he was fake which was my first thought, but holding his ground. After a few seconds, I just left. It terrified me. I know what I saw and I know it was huge. I've seen lots of deer and that is what it definitely wasn't, but I don't think there are wolves in Alabama. And besides, I know they're big, but I don't think they're that big. Never saw it again. Pretty sure no one believes me. I was by myself at my camp off of Cypermort Point, Louisiana. I was getting it ready for the upcoming summer season by giving it a good cleaning and making sure all the plumbing and electricity was working and getting my boat ready for a summer of fishing and skiing. That night I was sitting out on the dock just drinking a beer and watching the moon, and there was three little lights that just appeared in the sky and seemed to move impossibly fast and change directions instantly. They traversed the entire skyline in a matter of seconds. If you have ever taken one of those tiny laser pins and swirled it across your ceiling, that's what it looked like. Only there was three of them. They were gone as soon as they appeared, but as soon as they disappeared the weather changed and the water became crazy rough from out of a dead calm just a few minutes before. The wind got so strong that I had to go inside. I was staring out of the window over the water trying to wrap my head around what just happened, and this boat appeared with no running lights and pulled into the jetty next to my camp and disappeared down the canal. I don't know if or of all those things are related, but it freaked me out a little. 
I tried to tell somebody about it when I got back home the first person I told gave me the stupid look like I was crazy and I haven't talked about it since. Bow hunting on my friend's property in Northern California for deer a few years ago. It's only five acres, but for some reason monster black tail like to come through that area. Set up where I see them coming through on trail camera at 4 a.m. and begin waiting. Still dark and I look over my shoulder behind me and see a bush I don't remember being there. About 15 yards from me, I continue to stare at this bush for about 20 minutes. During this 20 minute period the bush kept shape shifting, changing into the shape of a human, a bear, a rabbit, and all other various weird shapes. I look forward and look back and it's now moved and I start to realize it's not a bush and something keeps creeping towards me. It's obviously aware of me and is probably within 10 yards of me. I'm thinking it's a lion and this is getting real bad. It's still shape shifting and just floating along disappears behind a small hill ten yards to my left. Arrow knocked him ready for whatever this thing is to pounce on me. Arrow knocked I blast my headlamp and watch a doe book it away from me. Crazy what the imagination can come up with when your eyes can't fully adjust or comprehend to what you're looking at. It was a cold, early morning, and I was driving to work at 4 a.m., I had always preferred taking the back roads, even if it meant waking up a bit earlier. There was something calming about the quiet countryside as I navigated the twists and turns, far from the noise and chaos of the city. As I drove into a small valley, I noticed a thin layer of fog enveloping the landscape, lending an ethereal quality to the scene. My headlights pierced through the mist, revealing the road ahead. I continued driving, alert and focused until something unusual caught my eye. Suddenly, the fog right in front of me seemed to take on a peculiar shape. It appeared to form the figure of a teenager wearing a hoodie, his hands tucked into his pockets and his back to me. The sight was so unexpected and eerie that it sent a shiver down my spine. In the blink of an eye, the ghostly apparition seemed to flow over my car as I drove through it. It all happened so quickly that I didn't even have time to break. I just screamed, my heart pounding in my chest. I continued driving, my nerves rattled by the bizarre encounter. Now, I don't believe in ghosts, and I know it was probably just a freak shape in the fog, but it was enough to leave me shaken for the rest of my drive to work. As the sun began to rise and the fog dissipated, I couldn't help but replay the incident in my mind, questioning what I had seen. Though I knew it was most likely just an odd formation in the mist, The experience left me with a lingering sense of unease. Now, whenever I drive through foggy back roads, I can't help but keep an eye out for any ghostly shapes lurking in the mist. And though I still don't believe in ghosts, that chilling morning encounter has forever changed the way I perceive the world around me. The date is July 14, 2018, two days after my birthday. At the time I and my girlfriend were living with my parents in their old, old two-story brick house. Our room was upstairs. It was around 10 or 11 p.m. at night and I and my girlfriend are laying in bed. Nothing out of the ordinary was going on, just a typical night, just chilling out in bed. First of all, let me mention I'm a grown man. Yes, still live at my mom's house, but still a grown man. I don't get scared easily. I'm not afraid of the dark or the boogeyman, but this night is going to test my scaredness. I never even imagined in a million years something like this would ever happen. It was the furthest thing from my mind. We are lying in bed and my girlfriend had to go downstairs to use the bathroom or something. Mind you, the bedroom light is on, I'm lying in bed. The TV isn't on. Haven't watched it at all that day. But all of the sudden, This is how I'm going to describe it as close as I can. Well, all of a sudden it feels like my bed is almost shaking or vibrating, in a sense me not understanding what is happening. I start looking around, but as soon as I turn my head to the right, I can see plain as day a silhouette of a human shape. 
But this human shaped figure you could see straight through. It kind of looked like heat waves, but in the distinct shape of a human, no mistake about it. Okay, let me pause and do a recap. I came to realize that the bed shaking or vibrating was actually me trembling out of the fear way before I even saw anything. It's like my gut feeling was in tune trying to warn me. Back to me seeing the human shape see through figure. I was just stuck in a stare or gaze of awe when suddenly I watched it walk to the foot of the bed, all the way right to my side of the bed, and in a split second my conscience said, get the f up now and run. So I jumped up and I swear I don't even remember walking down the stairs. I was gone that fast. Now mind you my mom, my dad, my sister, and my girlfriend are all right there in the dining room when I bolt through the downstairs door. They looked at me and said what's wrong, you are as pale as a ghost. I kinda didn't want to say anything to them because let's be honest what if I told you that I saw a clear person? How the hell are you going to react? But this is the weird part, we don't mention this to anyone. About a week later, give or take, my niece comes over. She's ten at the time and likes riding the four-wheeler trike. So she rides it for a little bit shorter than her usual ride, and she comes in and she is pale as a ghost and we ask her what is wrong. What happened? She says please don't think I'm stupid, but I saw an invisible person chasing me on the four-wheelers. It had a grown-up body, but it was invisible, it didn't have any facial features, all you could see was just the shape or outline of a human-like body. I instantly got chills over my body. Well, I told her I knew exactly what she had seen because I had a similar experience a week before. I told her you're not crazy, it is real. I don't know what it is, but I saw it too. I have one more encounter with the same invisible shape being four years later. I want to say the same one, but definitely the same invisible shape entity. I grew up on a small property in regional Australia. We lived about 3-4 kilometers out of town, so not super far, but also far enough that we never really get disturbed. On top of that, we were on a dead-end street, down the end of another street off of the main road, so not once have I ever seen a pedestrian near my house. Anyway, one night when I was about 12, I was watching TV when two of my brothers came downstairs and said, Did you hear that? I was pretty glued to the TV so didn't hear a thing, but apparently they heard footsteps outside and a couple of hushed voices. Seeing as how my brothers were both around 20 and both big rugby playing dudes, their plan was for me to wait inside, while they ran outside and tackled anybody they could find before calling the cops. So they both sprinted out the front door at the same time, splitting in different directions to wrap around the house and meet again on the other side presumably each with a criminal wrapped in a headlock under their arm. If you've ever seen that movie Signs where Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix run around the house, basically just picture that. Anyway, they never found them. Swear to this day that they heard voices, but nobody was ever seen. Our property has a lot of thick bushland right up to the house, so all we can think is that when my brothers came out, these guys just dissolved back into the bush and watched then probably just took off once the coast was clear again. The whole thing scared the hell out of me. One day, while I was working as a park ranger in the Gila National Forest, I received a report of a possible Bigfoot sighting in the area where the couple had camped. I decided to investigate. I arrived at the location and met with the couple, who were still shaken up by their experience. They told me about the tree knock they had heard, and how they had felt uneasy for the rest of the night. I listened intently and asked them to show me exactly where they had camped and where they had heard the noise. As we walked through the woods, I noticed that the area had thick vegetation and a lot of animal tracks, but there were no signs of any recent human activity. We reached the spot where they had camped, and I examined the area for any unusual signs. I noticed a few broken branches and small footprints that could have belonged to a bear or a large animal, but nothing conclusive. 
I decided to stay in the area overnight to see if I could observe anything unusual. As night fell, I set up a camera and sat quietly, listening for any noises. The woods were quiet, with only the occasional hoot of an owl or rustling of leaves. As I sat there, I thought about the stories I had heard of Bigfoot sightings and wondered if there was any truth to them. Suddenly, I heard a loud crashing noise in the distance, followed by a series of deep, guttural grunts. I quickly grabbed my flashlight and camera and started to make my way towards the noise. As I approached, I could see a large, dark figure moving through the trees. I tried to get closer, but the figure quickly disappeared into the underbrush. The next morning, I examined the footage from my camera and was surprised to see a blurry figure moving through the trees. While it wasn't conclusive evidence of Bigfoot, it did leave me with more questions than answers. I returned to the couple and showed them the footage, and they were amazed and frightened at the same time. In the end, I couldn't say for sure what the couple had experienced, but I did know that there was something strange going on in the Gila National Forest. I witnessed a bizarre creature run across my driveway. I own 14 acres of woodland, and I am also surrounded by forest just outside of Oxford, Connecticut. I was driving down my driveway when a bipedal creature about four feet tall and about as wide as my thigh ran out of the woods to my left, across my driveway, and into the woods and yard of the property on the right. It was about ten yards away from me, so I got a good look at it. It looked like a tree on legs with small arms. No visible curves, hips, or shoulders. Just straight. It was brown, skinny, with no fur or hair, lightning fast and light as a feather. Almost looked like it wasn't even touching the ground. I didn't hear a sound from it running and all the birds and other animals were dead silent. When it ran it didn't prance like most animals or run like a human. Its legs were moving as if you were pedaling a bicycle. I saw the back and a bit of the right side of it. I didn't see the front or a face. I didn't see a tail, ears, or any other body parts a normal animal or human would have. About two months ago, I was outside around 10 p.m., and there were two owls hooting back and forth. Then I heard this god-awful screeching sound wasn't a fish or cat or screech owl. I have no idea if that was related or not. I don't do drugs and I was not drinking. I am not on any medication or anything like that. I don't know if it was for sure an alien, but I don't know what else it could be. I did not see any craft or anything, although I wasn't going to walk through the woods to look either. Ever since I started studying the Bigfoot phenomenon four years ago, I've been fascinated by the countless theories and stories surrounding this elusive creature. One such theory that caught my attention was that Bigfoot was said to eat skunk cabbage, Lysichitum americanum. In my fieldwork near Molala and Estacada, I examined several skunk cabbages, hoping to find some evidence that would support this theory. However, all I found were signs of insect consumption, nothing that would suggest Bigfoot or any other large animal had been feeding on the plants. Despite this setback, I remained determined to find evidence that could shed light on the eating habits of Bigfoot. Recently, my efforts seemed to have paid off when Frank Canaster, the director of Bigfoot headquarters in Colton, Oregon, mailed me several photos that offered promising evidence. The photos, taken on June 14, 1995, near Malala, showed skunk cabbage leaf stalks that had been freshly broken off at the base and arranged across small six-inch logs, as if to be dried. Although the photos were dark, they were enough to rekindle my excitement about the possibility that Bigfoot might indeed be utilizing skunk cabbages as a food source. I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets these enigmatic creatures might be hiding, and how much more there was to learn about them. With renewed enthusiasm, I decided to venture back into the field near Molala and Estacada to further investigate this intriguing development. 
As I carefully examined the area where the skunk cabbage stalks had been found, I realized that something had indeed been using these plants. But whether it was Bigfoot or some other animal, I couldn't be certain. However, the discovery of the broken and arranged skunk cabbage stalks had provided me with a new clue in my ongoing quest to unravel the mystery surrounding Bigfoot. I was more determined than ever to continue my research and hopefully one day find the definitive evidence that would prove the existence of these elusive creatures. As I walked through the dense forest, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe and wonder at the thought that I might be sharing this space with a creature that had managed to elude human detection for centuries. It was a humbling reminder of how much we still have to learn about the natural world and the incredible mysteries that lie hidden within it. And as I continued my search, I knew that I was one step closer to uncovering the truth about Bigfoot and the enigmatic skunk cabbage connection. I live in the suburbs of Southern California, San Diego County area. On several occasions when letting my dog out, I would see odd silent flying craft with spotlights shining scanning around. My dog would growl and rub back inside. He would not leave my side for the rest of the night. In other nights when my insomnia new kicks in, I don't fall asleep till about 4 a.m. During the summer nights, I leave my window open to cool down since I don't have air conditioning. Around 2.33 o'clock in the morning, I hear a screeching sound that sounds like no animal I know that lives around me. I heard a pack of coyotes make a kill. When the feast, the whole pack yelp and howls. They killed around three and the screeching started. The sound traveled so fast to the coyotes and then suddenly the sounds turned extremely violent. Heard at least four coyotes yelping in pain only to be silenced moments later. Seeing and hearing this shit makes me want to be home, or a place where I am sleeping at, by 2.30. If I am out later for any reason I start watching the skies and turn down my music so I can hear. If I hear or see anything that is out of the ordinary I pull over and lay as low and as quiet as I can. I get scared even more when my radio goes to random static in places that normally doesn't have any problems. I start moving again when the static clears or the screeching sounds far enough. My boyfriend and I were on a hike in the mountains of Colorado and were unaware it was a secluded place until we got there. Our car was the only one parked at the trailhead and after three miles on the trail, one set of footprints appeared in the snow going the same direction as us. There were no footprints coming back out. We even yelled and clapped a bit to make sure whomever it was wasn't hurt or stuck, but got no response. On a rowing team, coach couldn't get off work, so it fell to me to direct practice. Steady stayed long, slow, maintainable, paced for a long time up the river to the Lake Erie appropriately. Four rowers and myself, all of them facing backwards, with me steering and directing them. We leave from Toledo, north down the Maumee, which is a shipping corridor. By the time we pass the last boy, there were no lights ahead late afternoon practice, late fall, clouds, light drizzle, and there was nothing but a black wall to look forward at. Our bow light threw off too little light to really see by, just enough to be seen. Given that our team had discovered corpses on every other attempt at this row, we were expecting to see some shit. Not seeing anything was equally disturbing though, and it was getting late, so we turned around. Now the rowers got to stare into the blackness. This prompted scary stories. Good ones were shared, and finally we had light again. The mood lightened. All of a sudden, off to starboard, we all see something leaving a ripple. Descriptions all agreed it was round in shape, supported by a thin stem leading into the water, presumably to a larger body. It followed us for maybe 30 meters, then dropped into the water without a trace, no splash, just the trailing ripple it had behind its stem. 
five of us saw the same thing. No one said a word until it was gone. Still have no idea what it was. I packed into Hammersley Wild Area in upstate Pennsylvania a few years ago with a friend. I brought along a new set of Motorola walkies, and after we set up camp my buddy decided to hike up to the ridge behind us so we could mess around with them. He was about three quarters of the way up and long out of sight of me when he keyed his radio to say something. At the exact same time I heard what sounded like a loud growl or roar from off in the distance. There was a bit of delay on my walkie-talkie, and then I heard the growl come over the speaker followed by my buddy saying, WTF was that. He came back down in a hurry. No idea what made the sound, but it was eerie as hell. Another night in the same area, we had a pack of coyotes circling our tent and howling like banshees. Not much sleep was had that night. I was riding with my good friend in his 1970s Land Cruiser Jeep. We wanted to go out in 4x4 in the snow, as I had traveled over to John Day from Salem where it never snows. The snow was coming down in a torrent bringing visibility to a minimum. But we were just creeping along a logging road, through about 12 inches of snow. As we rounded a bend in the road, we came to an open area where they stack fallen logs and Bigfoot leapt out in front of the vehicle. It stopped for a second and faced us then jumped off the road to the other side. My friend yelled, oh my god, what was that? We jumped out of the vehicle and I had my 9mm D-Wood pistol with me. When I jumped out, I set the box of bullets on the hood. We walked forward to where it had jumped out and saw the footprints around 16-18 inches long fresh in the deep snow. My friend shined his flashlight in it and you could make out the toes. It was snowing so hard that they were already beginning to fill in and we looked at each other and panic overcame us. My friend shouted, Oh my god what if we get snowed in we have to get out of here. He screamed this and I was overcame with panic. I started to fire my pistol into the air and emptied the clip. I turned to run back to the vehicle and grab my box of bullets off the hood, and they were gone. Just an indentation in the snow on the hood where I set them. No slide marks, they were just gone. We drove out of there in a panic. It wasn't until we got out onto the main Bear Creek Road that we started to calm down, and later we asked each other what happened, why were we scared. Normally this would not have frightened us, we were 1819 and had no fear. When I was younger, in elementary school, I used to have the same dream every weekend starting on Saturday when I would go to sleep, and then waking up in the middle of the night on Sunday and throwing up. The dream was always a bunch of numbers. Not even anything happening, just a bunch of random jumbled up numbers all over the place. I never understood why that happened where the same dream would happen on the same night every week and I would throw up every single time. I always think about it and wonder what it was or if it was just some weird coincidence. Also I would not have any signs of being sick before or after. Maybe someone else has experienced this. Two years ago, back in high school, my friends and I would go ghost hunting. Whenever we were bored and wanted to be out late, we'd drive around and try and scare ourselves with urban legends and creepy places. We never really found anything substantial, but we had a habit of driving along this old, two-lane road Riverdale, where most of the ghost stories in our city stemmed. The road is long, narrow, and curvy. It stretches for about 20 miles north and south. Four of us were in the car that night, and as usual we managed to get a pretty good paranoia vibe going. We had never driven all the way south until the road ran out before, and we decided to do that then head home. It was almost one in the morning by the time we reached the end, and when we had turned around and began driving back, 
My friend driving Roman 6 adjusted her rear view mirror and said, I think this car is following us. I thought she was just being paranoid and told her so, and that since the road was one lane either way they might just be going the same direction we were. She was convinced though, saying that the car was staying just far enough back that if she hadn't been paying attention she never would have noticed. We kept driving north, passing main exits, and the car stayed back far enough to see us, but not extremely close. We turned east on a main road that was still several streets away from where I lived, but eventually would lead there. Roman 6 was still convinced the car was tailing us, and debated pulling into a Walmart parking lot, but I advised against it because it was so late, and there were only a few cars there. By now the rest of us were starting to get worried too, and Roman 6 hooked a left and went south on a little used cross street that wasn't even paved. The car behind us, which we think was a dark blue Ford Ranger, followed us down this as well. Since we were doubling back on the way we came, we were all convinced she was right. We kept encouraging her to speed up, to try and evade them somehow, but we were the only two cars on the road. At the next major intersection she hooked a right without signaling or being in the turn lane, but the car's headlights stayed behind us. We drove to the next intersection, going right and heading north, worried and unsure of what to do. We didn't want to call the police because we knew this car really hadn't done anything yet and our state had a curfew for people under 18. We knew we weren't going to drive to anyone's house though, and in a split-second decision we turned into a neighborhood, thinking that maybe whomever was in the car was just trying to scare some kids and would leave once they assumed we went to our homes. To our relief, the car turned left, into an opposite neighborhood, and we all relaxed. Then my friend in the back seat turned around and noticed the car had flipped a U-turn and was waiting for us to turn the corner. They had turned their lights off. At this point the street curved and we lost sight of them. Roman 6 sped up and having watched drive like a week before we turned into a cul-de-sac, parked in between two cars and turned off the car. We sat in darkness and debated whether or not to call the police. We decided we should, and as I went to dial 911 we realized we had absolutely no idea what street we were on or what neighborhood we were in. After 10 minutes of doing nothing, we got up the courage to leave and try and drive to the nearest main road, where we wouldn't be blocked in or maybe there would be other cars. As we went to turn onto the street, the ranger turned the corner and stopped as we did. They had been waiting for us. Roman 6 floored it, hoping to get pulled over or something, and we went 80 going out of there. We managed to head west on a main road and soon, when we had driven for minutes, speeding, we saw other cars and people. I don't know if that car followed us out of the neighborhood or not, or what the person or people inside planned to do. But they were willing to follow us to what could have been our houses, and I'm sure that if Roman 6 had never noticed them, then they would know where we lived. I've never seen that car again, but I'm always a little paranoid when I drive late at night by myself. I was hunting on my uncle's property in southern Kentucky near Daniel Boone NF in the summer of 2011. He also had a good sized pond down in the very woodsy part of his 60 acres, and I set up some fishing poles at night rigged to land some catfish. It was about a 20 minute walk from camp to the pond, and it was a pitch black night, also very quiet. I specifically noticed a lack of critter noise including insects. I walked down through the field and reached the pond which sat up against miles of forest. My only light was my headlamp. As I was reeling in one of the poles, I must have spooked something and heard an enormous splash, and something let out a massive wailing or grunting noise and crashed through the forest. It was seriously so loud that it rattled my chest. I dropped the pole and hauled ass back to my camp full on fight or flight mode. When I told my uncle about it, 
He looked petrified and talked about how he is convinced a Sasquatch lives on his land due to similar occurrences he has had. All I know is that it scared me so badly to the point that I haven't been back. I've backpacked and hunted all over. I've never experienced anything like those noises. Didn't see anything but heard. I lived in rural Massachusetts to anyone who's familiar that means miles of woodland with spaced out suburban areas in between. I was walking down my grandfather's logging trail getting ready for his funeral. I'm also an avid mushroom collector so I'm always walking slowly and staring at the ground. Friends hate me basically so I get to this cool little white captain mushroom and stop to take a close up picture of it and that's when I heard it. The best way I can describe it is as if somebody with a lot of flesh on his knuckles were punching a tree. Now I know what a deer sounds like when they stomp to protect their children and are smashing their antlers on trees. I've heard bear, fish, or cat moose pretty much any animal in the western Massachusetts that exists so naturally I looked up and freaked the hell out. It was so rhythmic thud 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 it went on for many at the same pace. So being the curious person that I am I let out a whistle that couldn't be mistaken for a bird. Right after my whistle I hear a low quick whistle back. My first thought is oh it must be some logger scooping the land past the no trespassing gate ignorant I know. So I yell out hello pretty much as loudly as I could then whatever it was ran away faster than I've ever heard a human being run. And using my experience with deer dogs moose and bear. I just assessed that I could have possibly rationalized it being a four-legged creature. I know that what they sound like running, and this was much closer to a two-legged creature, I'm 100% positive on that. What doesn't make sense however is that the two-legged creature that when it ran away from me faster than any two-legged creature I have ever heard before also sounded like it was at a minimum 250 pounds. The steps were loud and very frantic. A lot of people believe Bigfoot has a spiritual connection to the forest it remains in, and thus the creatures in it as well. I do not find it a coincidence that this happened the day of my grandfather's funeral. I ran all the way home and I have never looked back. I had an encounter with the winged creature myself and even posted the story of what happened to a group on Facebook that talks about things. I'm 32 years old and had never seen anything supernatural or alien in my life until last summer. I had always been and still am very much a skeptic, and to this day I try to convince myself that what I saw was actually a really big hawk or something, but I know I'm lying to myself. It was around 3.45 a.m., I'm driving west on 322 towards Chesterland, Ohio. I'm driving a Freightliner box truck with a load of newspapers. In the summertime of 2016 at night, there was always a layer of fog hanging down around the ground, and the moon was bright and the stars were out. Going about 50 miles per hour through the hills, I see this dark figure in the moonlight that was coming right at me. It looked huge so I slammed the brakes and actually ducked down instinctively because I was driving right toward it at windshield level. I heard a big thud as the figure had gone over the cab and smacked right into the flat aluminum box right behind the cab at probably 40 miles per hour. I kept my foot on the brake and came to a stop on the side of the road probably about 75 yards from where the impact happened. Wondering if it had smashed into the top of the box and thinking maybe I could see what it was I hit, I got out and looked around. The box wasn't smashed in so I walked around to the back of the truck, and that's when I saw it in the moonlight almost as clear as day. This thing was huge. I thought for sure it was dead, but all of a sudden it rolled over, and that's when I saw its bat-like wings, not bird-shaped. It rolled over and stood up on two legs and was at least six feet tall. The thing looked right at me with its red orange eyes and I was literally frozen in fear. I could not move at all. Then it spread its huge wings out, jumped up and flew off. 
I ran back to the truck and took off towards Chesterland as fast as I could and spent the rest of the night on edge and trying to rationalize what I had just seen. The closest thing I could describe it to is the Jeepers Creepers monster, but I wasn't that close to it that I could see facial features and much detail. Just the six-foot-tall bat-winged man with orange-red eyes. I do that route for work every week and every time I go through that stretch on 322 I get uneasy. It freaks me to this day. I was 13, I think, going through severe depression, crying a lot for no reason most of the night, got up to go to the washroom and wash my face. When I got out of the washroom, there was this thing, hovering by the TV table in the hallway. It had limbs but very long fingers with long nails. Hair was like an afro, but with long strands of spiky locks. I can't remember the facial features, but I remember staring at in disbelief, and it smiling back at me. I remember how the feet were floating few inches from the ground and how the white gown it wore was flowing. After I looked away and looked at the same place where it was, it was gone. I never saw it again. I have never hallucinated in my life. It seemed very real, like actually seeing another person in front of you, and the distance between the washroom and the living is not far, close enough to see someone smile or blink. Around nine or ten years ago, when I was twenty-one, I used to play a lot of online poker. One night, it was pretty late, maybe around 3 a.m., and I decided to step outside for a smoke break. As I stood there, a little side street led into mine, and a strange van pulled out. It stayed there for a good 25 seconds, which I assumed was them scouting the area. I noticed they turned their heads towards me before driving off to the left. My neighborhood was usually quiet, and I didn't think much of it. However, a sudden uneasiness washed over me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. Then, out of nowhere, a voice whispered my name directly into my right ear. I could feel the breath, the vibration of the voice, and its warmth. But when I looked around, there was no one there. Not a single soul. I checked my neighbor's front yard and my garage, but I found nothing. Feeling unnerved, I tossed my cigarette, went back inside, and logged off my computer. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As I was shutting down the PC, the van slowly drove past my house again. To this day, I firmly believe that the mysterious voice saved me from something sinister. What could have happened if I hadn't heard it, I'll never know but I'm grateful for that inexplicable intervention that night. So me and my friends were going airsofting in my friend's woods at night. There were five of us. Three were on a team and the other two had to go into the woods and set up a plan. When they were done we went to go in, but were stopped multiple times by my friend who did not want to go in at all. He kept having a dreaded feeling the whole time. I felt the same way, but I thought it was just the feeling of being hit by pellets or something. So I ignored it. When we finally went to go on a figure properly about six feet five, not skinny and not big either, ran towards us, but then changed directs once all three of us started to shoot at it. I was in arm's reach of it. I couldn't see his face or anything like it was blocked. Our shots did not affect him at all. His stance did not falter, then he ran into the woods, and the other two seen him as well, and they came running back to the rest of us. We traced his steps, and they abruptly stopped in the middle of the woods. But there was no sign of him at all. It almost doesn't feel real, and I can't get him out of my head. What do y'all think? For years now I have kept silent about a sighting I have had, but after much research, I simply cannot explain what it is I witnessed a few years ago. A little background on myself. I am an avid bird watcher, and I am particularly fascinated by birds of prey 
and have read and owned many books on birds and have gone on many bird-watching expeditions. It is safe to say that I did not mistake my sighting for any bird. I am also a qualified pilot, so I have also learned to judge the distance and size of things in my environment. Time and place of the sighting. July 2010 around midnight, Dornport, Pretoria, South Africa. Dornport is on the northern outskirts of Pretoria. My house was less than a mile from Wonderboom Airport. To the north of the suburb is open fields with farms and platinum mines. I had not seen my brother in a while, and he and his wife came to visit me and my wife. As July is in the heart of the winter in South Africa, we spent most of the time inside. As we both smoke and don't smoke in our house my brother, and I went outside every time we wanted to smoke. At about midnight, we decided to go for a last smoke before going to bed. It was a clear, cloudless night, and there was sufficient moonlight so the sky was bright. As we were sitting outside, something in the sky caught my attention. I looked up and saw a creature slowly flying overhead. The thing that most caught me off guard was how white it was. It was so white it almost looked luminescent. It definitely had bat wings, and it flapped them very slowly. It was about 70 feet above ground level, and it had a wingspan of at least 10 feet, but I would say it was between 12 and 14 feet. My brother also saw it. After it flew slowly overhead in a southerly direction, my brother and I just looked at each other, extinguished our cigarettes, and went inside. At first, I thought it was some kind of fruit bat, but the only species I could find that was somewhat on the light-colored side that is found in the area was the straw-colored fruit bat. But it is much smaller than the creature I saw, and I looked at a lot of videos of them flying since, and their wing beats are much faster than the beats of the creature we saw. Over time I have researched all manner of bats, and I cannot find anything that matches what I saw in color and size. It has been over seven years, but I can still clearly recall what I saw and the fear I felt because of the sheer size of this thing. I am Leon Adler, a corporal in the U.S. Marines working as a security officer at US Marine Base Quantico in Quantico, Virginia in 2020. It was just another night on my nightly patrol on the west side of the base. During a break, I went into the woods to check one of the game cameras I had set up to look for trespassers and poachers. As I made my way to the creek where the camera was, just a few feet into the woods off the road, I noticed that the woods seemed to go silent. I found it deeply unnerving. When I finally reached the creek and started checking the card on my laptop, Sitting by a tree, I began to make out the sound of bipedal footsteps coming through the forest. At first, I assumed it was a person. As I scanned in the direction of the steps, I suddenly saw a white-tailed deer step out of the foliage. It was a really nice-looking buck with at least eight points and appeared to weigh about 180 pounds. What really threw me off was how it went from sounding like a human to seeing a deer. There was a large oak tree adjacent to the clearing, and I watched as the deer slowly walked over to the tree and stood in front of it. It then exploded into a furious rage, smashing its face into the tree violently. I could hear the animal's bones cracking and its grunting as it repeatedly smashed its skull into the tree in a wild rage. It was unbearable to watch. I suspected that the deer might have been suffering from a chronic wasting disease a fatal neurological illness affecting deer and other animals. But then something even stranger happened. Most animals' retinas reflect back at you, but I saw no reflection of the retinas, which was just weird. As the buck finished smashing its face, it took a step back and stood up on its hind legs. That's when in the clearest voice I have ever heard in my entire life it said, I know you're there. I was freaked out and scared. How could it say anything when it doesn't have a working jaw, much less a voice box? I felt like I was frozen in time, unable to react. I tried to rationalize what I was seeing, 
but every explanation I came up with didn't make sense. The only thing I could come up with was that it was a skinwalker. Looking at it, it felt like something that's been their way before we have, and will be their way after we're gone. The voice was similar to the deep ancestral voices of old Native Americans. It felt like I had been watching it for hours, but it was probably just five to ten seconds. The buck dropped back down on all fours and walked back into the brush. I dropped my laptop and quickly ran back to my vehicle and left. A month later, I returned to the spot to grab my laptop and the camera. The laptop wasn't covered in leaves and grungy like I expected it to be. It was like I had just left it there twenty minutes ago. I checked the tree where the buck had been smashing its face into and found splinters of bone and antler. It made my stomach drop, but it was also nice to know that I wasn't insane. Whether it was supernatural or not, I didn't want to be around it. One evening during the summer of 2019, I went outside on my porch to smoke a cigarette. It was still light out. I live near Rochester, Minnesota. There is a small hill directly across the street from my house, and I noticed two kids, a young boy and a girl, walking up the hill. They stopped and looked back at me, but I got a bad feeling about them. They were wearing dark blue vinyl windbreakers with hoods, and as I looked closer, I could see that their eyes were black. They started to walk down the hill and come across the street walking directly toward me. I was cordial and introduced myself to them. They continued to advance toward me. I was getting scared, so I quickly went back into the house. I asked my wife if she heard me talking to the kids. She heard nothing, so I just put it out of my mind. The evening was quiet and my wife and I went to bed around 11 p.m. After several minutes of laying in bed, I started to feel strange. I looked towards the window we have a one-floor ranch-style house and saw the girl standing outside his window. I freaked out and went to make sure the doors were bolted. When I got to the kitchen door, I could see the boy standing on the back porch. I ran back to the bedroom and grabbed my 45 automatic. I just assumed that they were attempting to break in. By that time I was extremely scared. I went to pick up the telephone to call 911, but the next thing I remember was waking up in bed the next morning. It was just after 6 a.m. My wife was awake and looked at me. Where did you go last night? I told her I didn't go anywhere. She said that she heard the back door close around midnight and that she went to see what was going on. She said that she couldn't find me. I told her what had happened and she thought that I hiding something from her. I still don't know what happened. I've read about lost time and alien abduction, but I always believed it was bunk. I still don't really believe it. Were these black-eyed kids aliens? By the way, I no longer smoke. I just don't have the urge anymore. Why? I have no idea, but I had smoked for almost 30 years. Growing up, I had always been captivated by the strange and mysterious stories my family would share during gatherings. One story in particular that my grandfather would often tell was about an eerie encounter my great-grandfather had many years ago. My great-grandfather used to ride a tonga, a horse-drawn carriage, for his daily commute. One evening, as he was passing through a dense forest, he noticed a beautiful kid baby goat standing all alone by the side of the road. Its innocent appearance tugged at his heartstrings, and he decided to take it home and adopt it, thinking that it was abandoned. He stopped the tonga, got down, and gently picked up the little goat. As he settled back into the carriage with the kid in his arms, the horse suddenly began to freak out, as if it sensed something unnatural. Confused and concerned, my great-grandfather looked down at the baby goat, only to find that it had grown abnormally large legs, disproportionate even for a full-grown goat. Fear coursed through him, and he hastily threw the creature out of the carriage, 
urging the horse to bolt away from the spot as fast as it could. He never looked back, and the chilling encounter remained a mystery that haunted him for the rest of his life. What's interesting is that both my great-grandfather's experience and the story of the faceless creature I had encountered seemed to share a common thread. The interaction with an otherworldly being that revealed its true nature, as if to remind us that there are things in this world that we may never fully comprehend. In both instances, there was a moment of realization that what we initially believed to be a harmless, familiar sight was actually something far more sinister and unknown. It's a stark reminder that there's a thin line between the world we know and the mysteries that lurk just beyond our understanding, and sometimes when we least expect it, we may catch a glimpse of the inexplicable. Quite a few years ago, I drove a taxi to have some kind of income. One night after the pubs had closed, I had delivered a dude far out on the countryside, and was on my way back towards the city again when I came to an area mostly covered by acres for farming where there are no street lights at all, so my car's headlights were the only light source while following a somewhat twisty road. Then I came to a short downhill section that turned into a left turn where the road straightens out after the turn. I had driven this stretch of road many times before, but when I was driving downhill and turned into the left, my headlights lit up four persons out on the field dressed in white, hooded robes with a lot of dangling things on them. They all turned their attention towards me, and their eyes all lit up in a bright yellowish color. This freaked me the F out, so I stepped on the pedal and just noped the F out of there. I have no idea what that actually was, to me it seemed like some cult stuff, but that does not explain their glowing yellow eyes. Nobody I have asked about it later on have never seen anything like it, and there isn't supposed to be any kind of cult in town at all. Not sure if it's a thing out on the Norwegian countryside, though. So I like to go to cemeteries and walk around. While doing so, I always record with my iPhone and my digital voice recorder. I find it interesting to see the different styles and types of headstones, as well as the ages of the deceased, and at times when I review my recordings, I get EVPs. This time was no different than any others. This cemetery is from the early 1800s and sits on the top of a hill. One side is overlooking a man-made lake, so there is plenty of water to help add to the energy if you believe that it does or can. So last night, I start to review my audio recording. It didn't take long before the first EP showed up. A faint but clear whisper of help in a male voice. Then as I am narrating about where the cemetery is located, and that when it was started there was no lake there yet, just a valley, another faint if that says, look followed a few seconds later by a male voice saying, don't look, both of these are in different tones. I then say out loud, Here's a Civil War veteran. He lived until 1933. He was in the army. I say that I was in the army too. Thank you for your service. And as I walk on I get, come back soldier, which made the hair stand up on me. Now the sound of a small plane flying overhead is heard, and I get this Eve a male voice that says, plane, now I know that I have a definite intelligent spirit with me. Then I come to this smaller headstone of a nine-year-old girl I will call Clarissa. On the top above her name was the picture of a stork flying and carrying a baby. I found it very sad, the pain that these parents must have went through. I am a father of six, all grown now. But that has always been my worst fear, to lose a child. But as I am describing her headstone and age, I say hello to her. Then in a female tone I get this Eve P leave here, and a split second later another one in a male voice, dickhead, maybe the mother and the father, then I come to another Civil War veteran, I will call Benjamin Suttles, who served with Company D 4th Ohio Cavalry, as soon as I said his name there was a male voice that clearly says, it was the war, 
Then over the course of the next three minutes, 25 seconds, I hear my name, Clinton, said in the same voice four times, with a forceful whisper of listen thrown in one time in the same male tone of voice. At the end, I get out of the car to open the gate to leave, and as I am opening the gate, it's inside the car still recording, and I get what sounds like a couple of hideous sounding growls. Now before someone says, well you're near a lake so it's probably voices of people out in boats and such, that is not the case, the temperature when I was there was mid 40s, with a stiff breeze and a wind chill in lower 40s to upper 30s, there were no boats out on the lake and there is nowhere close to there to fish from the bank and no parking areas near me. One side of the cemetery is the lake, the rest is all wooded except for the narrow one-lane road, which is not used much until summer, and the sun had already set and was almost complete darkness. As I said, I use my iPhone for my video and I use my old Sony Ict voice recorder, it's old as dirt basically, but it is very sensitive and reliable only downfall is that there is no card to save it onto, so I log everything on paper when I review it. I go to a large number of cemeteries to do this. I don't do what everyone calls it obsessions. I just record as I walk around and talk or ask questions. An incident at a cemetery very close to my home in 2019 got me to doing this. I have gotten some things that sound absolutely horrific and or demonic, pleas for help and even threats of bodily harm. I have been called by my childhood nickname numerous times, and they even told me of my father's upcoming death. It wasn't 100% accurate, but it was so close that I can't ignore it. I am still somewhat skeptical, but that is slowly wearing off. This stuff is out there, and it is very real, too real sometimes. Thanks for listening. Hope you already fallen asleep. See you tomorrow at the same time.